call the meeting of the Committee of the Whole to order. Will Tom Tom, will you call the roll? D. Berg. Here. E. Berg. Here. Uh, Doyle. Here. Manny. Here. Moody. Here. Perez. Here. Ports. Here. Schultz. Here. Stefan. Excuse me. Dee Akron. Here. T. Van Akron. Here. Vanderwilly. Here. Wangaman. Here. Warner. Here. And Wenninger. Here. Fifteen. Follow oh. Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> Fifteen present. We also need the uh, redevelopment authority. Mike. Thank you. We need approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of the Committee of the Whole. It's been moved in. Seconded to approve the minutes of the Committee of the Whole. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Can we all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Paulette, will you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. Uh, just for people that are watching or people that are in the audience, this is a joint meeting between both the Redevelopment Authority and uh, the Common Council's Committee of the Whole. That's why we needed to take both um, roll calls. We'll start the meeting off this evening uh, with a presentation from the people from Great Lakes. And Mayor Schramm, if you'd like to introduce the people for us. Thank you, Terry. First of all, I don't know, is this on? No. Now it is? Can you hear? Okay. First of all, I don't know if you know Ann Comer. She's from Corals and Brady's. She's with us this evening. Obviously, you know Steve McLean, our city attorney, Alderman Van Akron, Tom Holton, and Paulette Enders. We do have two gentlemen here from Great Lakes, Tom Sather and Mark Vaccaro, and they will give us a presentation on the Blue Harbor development. So, gentlemen, if you'd like to step up here, uh, and bring whatever boards or you have with you. So however you want to set up or if we have to move some of this around, let us know. These pretty pic pictures, as you can see, are, um, Oops, are pictures of what we envision uh, will come alive and, and come true on the shorefront and are a culmination of really now as we were come up, what's that? Let me sneak by here. As, as we were driving up here, we were reminding ourselves how long this process has been. All large developments mature slowly as much as you'd like to think that they go quickly they uh they take time we began working on this when tom last june, june. and uh to give you a little background when we started we had envisioned a single resort if you will of a total of how many units to one. about 160 to 180 units and as things evolved 
we really, uh, th the project itself has evolved into what we think is, a, is an optimal size project. And I wanted Tom to give us just a two or three minute nuts and bolts tour of what we're proposing to build here because it, it, it's impressive in its scope and scale and vision. So, Tom. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, the Blue Harbor Resort and Conference Center that we're proposing to develop uh, down in the South Pier District, um, like Mark said, has evolved over the months. And we've tried through economic modeling, through architectural studies, uh, impact, uh, input from the city staff, from designers to craft the project that we thought would best suit the needs of the district and would work best uh, economically as well. Um, early on in the process, we were contacted and asked if we would take an interest in looking at this project, the goal being to get a first-class, full-service, year-round resort uh, on the lakefront in Sheboygan that could attract both conference business and family business on a, as a year-round basis. Uh, our company, the Great Lakes Companies, uh, is in both the hotel and resort businesses currently. We have 12 commercial hotels and a number of resorts. A uh, resort that you may be familiar with is Great Wolf Lodge uh, Resort in Wisconsin Dells, uh, which is one of the properties that we own. And based on our, our family resort experience and also our corporate resort experience, we took a look at this project to see what the opportunities might be. The first thing we looked at was the site itself and what might be appropriate for this site. Um, if any of you that know Great Wolf Lodge know that it's a great big log cabin. And clearly that was not the right type of project for a beachfront, beautiful beachfront location like this. So we looked around at other possibilities and got design cues from other famous beach resorts um, that all kind of center around the same turn of the century Victorian beach resort theme, as you can see illustrated in these drawings. We've taken some visual cues from properties such as uh, the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego, uh, the Grand Floridian Resort uh, in Walt Disney World, and other types of projects that are already proven successful formulas that are, that are famous, that are successful, and who, whose looks have, have stood the test of time. And along those lines, we've crafted what we believe is the best the best project uh, for this site. The, the components include, and if you have a handout, I, hopefully they'll help um, illustrate that for you. I can't recall if there's a site map in there or not, but the overall project uh, consists of about slightly less than 17 acres along the waterfront down in the South Pier District with the beachfront uh, remaining in, in the public trust and open to the public and several access points available um, to that beachfront from the inside part of the project. On this end of the project, as you see up on the north end, is what is referred to as the convention center or the city-owned project. Uh, what, is, what is proposed right now is a complete facility with a, with a convention center and a first-class sit-down restaurant of approximately 37,800 square feet with a maximum uh, events capacity in the convention center of approximately 1,000 people. Uh, early in the process, uh, we, had, we had started out with a, a smaller general concept for this plan. It was, we'll elaborate on later. And as we really got to understand the marketplace and the needs of the marketplace, we've let this project grow a little bit to accommodate uh, a broader base of meetings and corporate and, and leisure business. The center part of the project, as shown here, is a 183-suite, uh, all-suite family resort that will include um, two themed restaurants, one a, a family, more family style restaurant, the other a bar and grill type of restaurant, both of which are heavily themed. There are some illustrations in the back of the handout that you have, some concept drawings that start to illustrate the vision that we have for these spaces as highly themed entertaining spaces. The lobby, as you can see in this color board up here, this conceptual color board, is a, a soaring three and a half story atrium lobby, similar to what we've put in our other family resorts, our Great Wolf family resorts, that creates not only a tremendous first impression of the property, but through a bunch of glass on the back end, opens up the views to the lake and the beach beyond, and also serves as the living room to the facility. And this, this is an area that we anticipate people spending, guests spending a lot of time in as they do in our other resorts. <coughs> beyond that, we have incorporated, so. We have on this end of the building, we really have, have the, the, the more corporate end of the facility. It's going to bring in the conventions, it's going to bring in the trade shows. The housing for all the guests, of course, is in the middle. Uh, also inside this facility, in addition to the two uh, restaurants, uh, are some, some retail space. And we are also uh, intending at this point to have a spa in the facility as well. On this end of the property 
is the indoor water park and family entertainment center co component. Uh, the, the indoor water park that we have scheduled uh, for this part of the project is 33,000 square feet for the water park itself, uh, which is modeled closely after a, a very popular resort we've built, Great, uh, Great Bear Lodge in Sandusky, Ohio. It's been very successful. It features all, all the big elements that you'd expect to find in a successful indoor water park, including tube slides, body slides, lazy river, indoor pools, hot tubs, kitty slides, um, geysers. And the central fe uh, feature is a, a million dollar, four story tall interactive treehouse with dozens of interactive devices. Um, this space will also be not just a playground, but will also be heavily themed. If you look at the far illustration down here, you see a concept drawing for some of the theming of one of the play elements uh, that will be in the park. Uh, we've done enough of these parks now that, that we feel like we're getting pretty good at it, and th this park has turned out very nice, and we're really excited to expand on uh, the nautical theme that we're carrying throughout the resort and throughout the convention center, and taking it into the water park and playing it up a little bit even more for the, for the fun of the kids. Well, one thing you should <laughs> note in the water park is really taking the historical elements of Lake Michigan and bringing that into uh, the water park itself. <clears throat> the history is so important, the history of Lake Michigan, and being on the lakefront really affords us an opportunity that we've never had before and won't ever have again probably. So bringing some of those elements into, uh, into the water park facility, it's, it's what Disney calls edutainment. It's uh, entertainment and education. There's going to be a lot of history weaved throughout the project. When you're in the restaurant, you're going to feel and see and hear a sense of history. The same thing when you're in the water park. I think that's real important to make us something different than what's been created in Wisconsin Dells, where there are now, candidly, 18 hotels that have some sort of a water park feature. We need to set ourselves apart from that. We've worked very hard over the last 12 months to create something that is truly unique. It's never been done before, and it's going to be very hard for anybody ever to do it again. And that's what we, that's what we want. We want a unique project that really stands the test of time. We realize for the city, this is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. It is for us as well. And I think you're gonna see that with the storyline that we bring into once you walk into the doors and through the project itself. Uh, just quickly to wrap up on the, the rest of the scope of the project, also incorporated uh, within the indoor water park and family entertainment complex is a small gift shop. Uh, there'll be food and beverage facilities. Uh, there will also be a large video game arcade, and also in addition to that, a play area where they can set up birthday parties, family reunions, other children's oriented activities. The last component uh, down on the south end of the project here as shown is a complex of 64 uh, resort condominium units that are set up in uh, four unit buildings whose character and architecture reflects the same style as the Grand Resort but it's set up into more of a village type setting. Uh, the intent for, these project, for this part of the project is that these, like many places in Lake Geneva, Door County, and Wisconsin Dells, will be sold to individual unit owners. When they are not using their um, units, they can put them back into the rental pool um, to help offset the cost of ownership and also to provide additional lodging for water park and convention guests. Um, we, we have worked real hard at putting this project together and really think that this is something uh, that is going to be not just spectacular by Wisconsin standards, but spectacular by anybody's standards. That this will be truly a world-class resort. Uh, we're very excited about this project and are very interested in getting it to move forward. Mark, if you want to take over. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is really a, a partnership between us and the city. Uh, when we're done, we will invest a total of about $68 million, I believe, uh, including uh, all of the, uh, the condominiums and the resort itself. And the scope has increased in size since we started. Um, the cities, in fact, let's, let's put up this, this chart right here. I want to get a little bit into the financial element of the project. And uh, we'd prepared something, in fact, uh, in large print because I think it really it really says it all in terms of what our contribution is and what the city's contribution is and we've worked real hard with the city and th the city has done an excellent job if you will putting the developers 
money where their mouth is. Uh, and, and I give them a lot of credit. When we started out, the thought was, well, the developer's taking the lead risk here. Uh, the developer is the pioneer. You're the first project to go in here. The first project, arguably, is always the riskiest. Once you've... Uh, <laughs> I think of helicopters. It's a little scary. The first project is really um, the, the pioneering one, the one that takes the, the risk. And when we first uh, met up with the city, the city had indicated we have an investment already in this island and that investment, or this peninsula, and that investment is growing. By 2005, the city will have invested about $6 million into the peninsula in land cost, in infrastructure, environmental remediation, et cetera, et cetera. And the hope was that with your development developer speaking to us, we're hopeful that the tax production that you produce will cover the cost that you require to make this project happen. To the extent that there's anything left over, that's a good day for us. We utilize about 40% of the total land area on the peninsula. Our project's about, what, 16, 17 acres. I think the total net area of the peninsula is about 41 acres. So of the city's $6 million invested, if our project pr could produce any part of that, or on the best case scenario, our proportionate share of that, then we would be not only the lead project, uh, the pioneering project, but one that makes our fair share contribution to the peninsula and the investment that the city's made. As we've gone through months and months, literally months of negotiation with the city, uh, working with the finance people and the development people, uh, I think they have worked out a scenario with the developer that is, in fact, very favorable to the city. Uh, if you look at, and I just wanted to illustrate this in very simple means, as our project is built out, we will produce taxes in two different areas. Real estate uh, incremental taxes and hotel taxes. And what we've done is taking the built-out project as proposed and the taxes that are projected from that based on valuations and, uh, and rate and occupancy projections from our appraiser, our third-party appraiser that our lender is relying on, we produce over the next 25 years about $52 million in taxes. The amount of monies that we are guaranteeing out of that total is about $41 million. Now that's over 25 years, and we said, okay, well, what's the present value of that using six, six and a half percent cost of capital? And even on the portion that we're guaranteeing, it's in excess of $20 million. So where the financial model stands today is that out of the $12.5 million that the city is loaning to the project for really two components. One is the city-owned convention center, and the second is the balance of site, infrastructure, and other related costs. We're producing not only enough taxes to cover all of those costs, but we are guaranteeing an amount in excess of that on a present value basis equal to $8 million, at least. So what started out really from the city's perspective as potentially a loss leader to get some development momentum on the island has turned out to be potentially a bonanza. And I congratulate the city for that. When our, uh, we have uh, Tom and myself have four other shareholders and we've been doing the heavy lifting on this project when we brought the other shareholders in and said, well, here's the deal and here's our part of it and here's what we're guaranteeing. They said, oh my God, what are you guys doing? And uh, we said, look, we all believe in the project. We know our capabilities as it relates to building something and operating it successfully. You know, a guarantee is a guarantee. Hopefully, nobody ever has to realize on that. So we're comfortable. We put our money where our mouth is, but we're comfortable at the end of the day, we're all going to win from this. So that, that gives you a little backdrop on the, 
on the financial modeling. Of course, there's, you know, 200 little details and definitions that go into this. I think our development agreement between ourselves and the city is now 70 or 80 pages long. I mean, it's, there's a lot of detail behind the detail. But the overall picture is a real successful financial partnership that puts uh, the city first, if you will, and the development first, which is really where it ought to be. That's kind of the, you know, the round uh, discussion of the project as it stands currently. We've emphasized to ourselves and to the city, really time I I at this point is of the essence. It's, it's taken a long time to get here. Uh, we've had a lot of work to do. The city's had a lot of work to do. We all feel that there's a drop dead date. A drop dead date is the world event next year, the PGA tournament, and that is in August. We have been successful building and opening our resorts to date such that they open slightly before summer. Summer, we know we're going to be very full, and you want to get these things off uh, with momentum and a wind at your back. So our goal is really to be open by June 1 of next year. It's a very aggressive schedule, one we think we can accomplish. We really can't afford to miss a beat. Uh, that'll give our staff some warm-up time. Uh, June, July, and August will be fabulous months for the resort. And then catering to the PGA is something that's just a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for all of us. We really envision the, uh, the ABC cameras, if you will, flying down the coast from the golf course and flying over the, uh, the resort in the downtown of Sheboygan. It's, it's going to be one of those memorable things that I think put Sheboygan on the map permanently in terms of a tourism city in addition to everything else. So we, we see that as really our drop dead timeline that everything has been built and backed into. Um, so we're, we're, we're very excited. We're ready to get started. And, uh, you know, a lot of work has uh, gone into bringing us to this point. But, uh, but uh, we're at a point where I think all that has transpired has been to really improve the project to something that has world-class potential. And that's, uh, that's why we're here. So thank you. I think what we'll do now, um, first of all, I'll open it. Can you take these down? Uh, why don't you leave them up for a while in case there's a couple. Okay. I'd like to open it up to the floor of the council first. Just if you have any questions on the presentation they gave. After they're done, we'll have the staff go through some of the high points in the, and some of the information on the actual agreement. On the actual agreement. Um, but does anybody have any questions on anything that they talked about? And like I said, let's keep it at this point to what their discussion was prior to uh, then we'll get into the agreement and we'll get into the other things and I will open it up to the uh, audience in the back also after we get through this. Alderman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned a $68 million investment. Is that your investment or the city and your investment together? Total, total project combined. Okay, thank you. And what are going to be the hotel room rental rates? Okay, and the condominiums are going to be mm -hmm. two two fifty. Okay, thank you. Neficent. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in your um, revenue projections in the original, uh, you had uh, thirty-six million four forty-seven seven seventeen, and that was based on the seventy-five percent. Uh, uh, estimate of the revenue, room tax revenue projected by the U.S. Realty. I see that you've upped that by 10 percent in terms of the guarantee. Could you explain how that changed or uh, yeah. where that came from? Yeah. yeah, the first, as I'm sure you can realize, as a project like this develops, it starts out as an idea, becomes a little more real every day. And what we did is, is got preliminary numbers from the consultants based on a project concept. Since that time, if my memory serves me correctly, um, the project's gotten slightly bigger. It's gotten a little bit more upscale. The convention center has gotten a little bit bigger that helps drive uh, business into there. And another factor was originally with the condominiums, 
uh, the unit mix was half two bedrooms and half three bedroom units, and now it's half two bedrooms and half four bedroom units. So the scope changed a little bit, uh, elevating the, the top line revenues for the project. And, and thus, really what happened is the U.S. Realty Consultants went back in as the scope changed and in, in, in the numbers changed and they went up. And our guarantee of that uh, increase went up as well. And uh, the, you know, the city asked us, they said, well, okay, the scope change is going up. You believe in your project more every day. In fact, the projections are going up. Are you willing to back those projections? And in a weak moment, we said, Sure, why not? And uh, all of a sudden, we were guaranteeing another $4 million, and we, we couldn't take a step back then. So here we are. The U.S. Realty, you know, that is a third-party proprietary firm that's not yeah. related to the city or to your organization. Right? No. So, so that's, that's No, something, in fact, who, who, who hired them? The city or the SDC? Yeah. And then our bank subsequently hired them through the appraisal. Right. Any other questions from Alderman Perez? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sather, in, in, in the press, a few, I believe a few weeks ago, you were quoted as saying that uh, it was your, your position that the uh, convention center did not make any money, and that's why your group did not want to invest on it, in it, that it was the city's insistence in having it. Has your position changed that uh, convention centers don't make money? I don't believe our position has changed. I mean, t typically, it seems that most of the convention centers that get built nowadays are built either by cities exclusively or with a lot of their help. Because it's a standalone basis, they're not usually very profitable. We're not experts on standalone convention centers by any means. But we do know that meeting space drives occupancy and drives rate and helps make the hotel part of the project work. Um, what will happen as, as a practical matter with this facility is that um, it has capacity to serve events that are far bigger than can be accommodated in our hotel. And very routinely, they'll, they'll be filling up hotel rooms all over the city. I, I don't believe that, that as, a, as a private developer, you could build a standalone convention center and probably make a very good return on investment. As a follow-up question, I noticed we were just handed a, a sheet here that says that the convention center now has, uh, the size has been increased, the capacity has been increased. And I'm just curious to, if it doesn't make any money, and now we're making it larger, is that some more money, city part of it? What, what role did you play in, in this market research that says now we need a bigger one? This, this that's a good question, actually. We started out very early in the process in our discussions with the city, and there was a desire by the city to have a convention center because those facilities did not exist presently. And they felt that there was a need for that. And, and at, at the initial time when we were programming this project, I don't think anybody really knew exactly what size would best suit the market and best suit the demands. Uh, a, a notion was set forth that maybe a facility that could host 600 people would be appropriate. It's a starting point that sounded reasonable to all the parties involved, and backing into the square footage required for that, that would be, we guesstimated probably about 20,000 square feet in the convention center end, and thought a, a good fine dining restaurant could be accommodated in, with about 7,500 square feet. So we had a scope of project of about 27,500 square feet. As the project became more real, uh, and we got market research feedback from people like U.S. Realty Consultants. Our marketing department, our operations department went out, did their call arounds, visited area facilities, started talking to uh, demand generators for this type of business. They, they were getting feedback that made them believe that they, what they really wanted was a bigger facility. I know that there were comments made by a number of people that, you know, that even the largest facilities at American Club were not big enough for some of the functions that certain people wanted to hold. Also, that the, it would be really too small of a venue for boat shows, car shows, things of that nature, and a lot of statewide uh, conventions. And as, as our, our feasibility people really dug into this, they, they came back to us and said, incrementally, is it that much more expensive to add this capacity? And the answer was really no, because the incremental square footage you add is the cheapest square footage in the project. And as we modeled with it, it just seemed that from the perspective of the resort needing you know, rooms to come in, all the other hoteliers needing rooms to come in, and being able to drive demand through that facility to accommodate the needs of the city and to get all this, t all this tax base and all the tourist business and corporate business coming through the community, that that ex extra step to be able to accommodate 
that added increment of business seemed to be a good investment. And that, that's really where we came up with that. Anything else, Alderman Perez? Alderman Winnegar. Uh, you have a convention. You need uh, most conventions have banquets at night. We we do. That's that's a good question. The way the facility is laid out, and I'm sure that there are there are places here in the city that drafts could be looked at as far as the layout. But there is a very large shared kitchen and prep area in between the seating area for the fine dining restaurant and the convention center itself. So they will have full um, dining dining services offered by the operator of the restaurant. The, the um, convention center, I wish we had an illustration of that with us right now, but consists of really three areas. One is back of the house where all the food is prepared and where all the offices are and such. The other is a, is a large pre-function space overlooking the lake with lake views uh, where they can have guest registration, cocktails, things like that. And then the main conference center is about slightly more than 10,000 square foot room uh, that is divisible through movable partitions into combinations of up to as many as seven separate rooms. I just want to add in one thing on the, the financial, uh, because your question was an excellent one, kind of the financial return, if you will, on the convention center. Madison, we live in Madison, we got to see the whole dynamic of the story that ultimately led to the building of the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Center. And it's a beautiful facility but it really came in backwards and there was something to learn from that and I think something to compare us to. They, it took 40 years to get it approved, believe it or not, and uh, after they finally got it approved, they spent $60 million on this convention center. Now it's fabulous, but it's $60 million fabulous. And after they got done, to it, done with it, they learned that, well, a convention center on its own can't fully realize its potential unless it has an attached hotel. Oops. Uh, so after they built this convention center, they had to lure in the Marcus Corporation to build what is a fabulous hotel, a Hilton Hotel. But in order to get Marcus in, they gave Marcus incentives of $33 million. None of that went to the convention center. All of it went to the hotel just so they could have a convention center and a hotel to be able to market to, uh, together. So by the time they were done, they'd spent over $90 million to promote their convention center. So I think in terms of what we've got here, going from a 600-person convention center to a 1,000-person convention center and having the, the additional investment that we've made to get it there, really, we look at how, how unique this opportunity is no, it wasn't designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. On the other hand, it's probably the only convention center of its size that may ever get built on a major body of water in the Midwest. So there is a real unique element to that. We think with the increment of 400 people, we can cater to not only statewide conventions, but region-wide conventions. We have a full house in that convention center with 1,000 people. This town is going to be buzzing. The hotels are going to be full. The restaurants are going to be full. The downtown, all of the investment that's been made in the retail down there is really going to start to realize its potential. And really, it's a function of bodies. More people in, the spin-off economic effect, effects are hard to measure, but you don't want to miss out on them. So as we got deeper involved in this project and realized how unique it is, it did. It began to grow into what we think is really an optimal size for, for marketing the city and the center. So, Anything else, Alderman Winninger? Uh, Alderman Moody. Uh, thank you. First paragraph in here says, since the inception of Blue Harbor Resort and Condominium, the city has desired the development of a city-owned convention center and fine dining restaurant. The city should also own a fine dining restaurant? It is, it's, a, it's a component that requires very little additional investment. Um, because basically, the way, the way, as I mentioned before, that it was set up is that um, the shared kitchen and all the back of the house facilities are already in place that have to service the convention center. So really all that has to be added to, to establish a fine dining restaurant is the seating area for a couple hundred people. So perhaps it's 10% of the size of that facility. And what, what it does, at least in concept, what it does is give people who are patrons of the convention center 
a place to go and have drinks or have breakout sessions or to have a luncheon before the conference if they don't want to have it in there. There's a lot of synergies between that. It's very, actually very common. Um, we've done that in pro properties that we have where you have a shared kitchen and restaurant on one side convention center. And the thought of having a fine dining restaurant is to further enhance uh, the quality and, and the credibility and the prestige of the South Pier District. I, I believe that was the thinking. Question about amount we are guaranteeing. Is that money that you put in escrow, a certain amount of money you put in escrow every year? Betty, if on those type of questions, I think Steve's going to be able to answer in a few okay. minutes because he'll tell you there are some things that are in escrow. There are some things that are guaranteed okay. from the company. There are some other guarantees. And, you know, I think those type of financial questions probably would be answered if we allow Steve to okay. go through the the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the restaurant, this, let's make it clear, the city's not getting in the restaurant business. Okay. The city will own the building and somebody else will lease both the convention center and the restaurant will be leased um, to a third party um, that will run it. We're, we're, you know, the city's not going to be flipping hamburgers as an alderman on Thursdays. Uh, <laughs> alderman Manning. Thank you. I'd like to have some commentary directed to the resorts that you have built and, and completed with their economic performance vis-a-vis -vis the market projections. Um, we've just opened <clears throat> our third resort along the same uh, brand that we started in Wisconsin Dells, Great Wolf Lodge of Wisconsin Dells. Our second resort was Great Bear Lodge of Sandusky, Ohio. And then recognizing that building a brand implies one name, not two, we went back to Great Wolf Lodge and, in fact, have trademarked that name in all 50 states. We've just opened our third Great Wolf Lodge in Traverse City, Ohio. Uh, in fact, only two weeks ago, I'm sorry, Michigan. Um, and our fourth one in Kansas City, Missouri, will open in about uh, three months, Kansas City, Kansas. Um, Sandusky was really the first one that we built from scratch. I would say it opened uh, a year ago from last March and has functioned ahead of projections uh, since literally the day it opened. We're getting some phenomenal early returns out of Traverse City where we measure how we think we're going to do against our benchmark or our pro forma is looking at Sandusky when we opened how many reservations did we have on the books? I think in Sandusky we had, how many was it, 10,000? 10,000, yeah, 1.1 million. We're now opening our second resort with approximately twice that in the bank and, and already operating ahead of schedule. So in terms of pro forma projections, we're pretty good at exceeding them so far. We've got a good track record. Market analyses and projections as U U.S. Realty Consultants. Yeah, good question. It is. Anything else, Alderman Man? Alderman Vanderwill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we were going on about the uh, convention center and the restaurant. Basically, what you're saying is you think it's a good investment, but you can't get the money to invest in it, so you want us to. Yeah, I'm sorry. Basically, what you're saying is you think the convention center and the restaurant or everything there is a good investment that you would like to invest in it, but you can't get the funds to do it, so you want us to do it. Yeah, it's, it's probably a bit more complicated than that. Tom, you, you wrestled with the modeling more. Yeah, re really on, on a standalone basis, if you know, the convention center just as a standalone operating business, like most convention centers, if not all, um, does not, on a standalone basis, generate enough profit to attract outside investment just to pay for it on a standalone basis. As a component of a greater overall project, it's very important and, and it drives business into the hotel. But the convention center, like, like most, like the one in Madison, um, is something that, that is seen as very positive for the community, very positive for businesses in the community. And that, that's part of the reason why we're here tonight is, is because the project does need some help in, in providing features like that to help the resort work. And in this, in this case, the city is taking, uh, you know, $8.2 million on the convention center to build the city-owned convention center, which in turn will be leased back to Blue Harbor. Anything else, Alderman Vanderwood? No, that's it. Anything else from anybody on the Alderman Perez? 
sorry. You're Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have another question, and I'm, I don't, I'm not asking for specifics because I believe that'll be get, uh, that'll be discussed later. But you say you have about 13 of these other uh, developments. 13? Tw 12 hotels 12. and three now approaching four resorts, okay. yes. And in the past, uh, how many municipalities have gone to this extent as far as providing monetary incentives yeah. with you? And are you aware of any other municipalities doing it with other developments? Sure. I, th I think in the past, uh, with our Great Wolf Lodge resorts, we actually minimize the amount of meeting space. They are wholly family uh, resorts. And on that basis, our economics stand on, uh, stand on their own. We have not in the past, with, with one exception I'll talk about in a second, required any subsidy, if you will, or loan monies from a community. In Kansas City, Kansas, in fact, we were granted star bonds of $8 million to incent us to go into that development. They were trying to create a whole zone that they wanted to attract. It was not that much of a dissimilar uh, uh, development from this in that the city created what we hope will become a tourism zone and then to get somebody to make a lead investment uh, incented them with star bonds which acts very similarly as the type of bonds we're talking about where the hotel tax and in fact in that case the sales tax and uh, the real estate taxes go to pay back those star bonds um, but we've never looked at a development uh, that has such a large convention center component and I would just say to uh, to everybody that I don't know that there's a convention center that's been built in the last probably 15 years in the United States that hasn't either been wholly built and owned by a city or substantially built by a city and usually with a lot of additional incentive that goes into the hotel development itself. Madison being, a, a, I think, in the end of the day, an outrageous example, but it, it's just, it's the nature of how it works. Another, another thing that's, that's different in this project from other ones that we've done is when we have done our resort projects, um, we've gone to established resort communities that already have millions of family visitors and vacation travelers passing through them, Wisconsin Dells, Traverse City, Michigan, um, Sandusky, Ohio, Williamsburg, Niagara Falls. The one exception um, to this so far has been when we were not choosing the market when the market chose us. When Kansas City, Kansas said, we would like you to come here and, and we, will, we will help you because we understand you need some help to make your numbers work. Very similar to this situation where we were approached saying, would you consider doing a project in Sheboygan? And at first we didn't know what, how to respond um, because it's not known as a, as a recreation destination the same way Niagara Falls is or Williamsburg is or the Dells is. So that, that's also factored into this. The average rate um, that we met, talked about earlier for this project, which is 180 something, is substantially lower than we're currently realizing in our other resorts. And part of that is because of the, of the unproven nature of, of, the, of the community as a resort destination, but we've proven to ourselves that we can create resort travel. And also the fact that convention business does not, you know, generate the same type of room rates as leisure business does. There'll, there'll, be, there'll be lower rates. Anything else? Alderman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you folks feel your project can be successful without the conference center, or does that have to be a part of it? Well, I think absolutely has to be a part of it, because without that, now we're just a family resort, if you will, in what is currently a non-family tourism destination. I mean, Sheboygan is what it is, but it's not Wisconsin Dells as it relates to you know, kind of the hearts and minds of families. And same thing with Traverse City. So we really think we need both components. We need the business traveler and the convention traveler to come to us on, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Monday nights. And we know we can accommodate the families on Friday and Saturday nights, but we just can't make those uh, a, a resort of this caliber and quality work on two or three nights a week, we need to fill in. So we've got a kind of nice barbell balance, if you will, between the family and the convention, conventioneer. We also recognize that the convention center business does come at a price. 
uh, they are, it's a very competitive business, and while we have projected $180 plus average daily rates, we're not going to get that from our convention center business. If we get over $100 to $110, we'll probably be lucky. So we're going to have to blend that against Friday and Saturday business where you get uh, rates in the strong $200 plus, dollars, and that's really kind of the barbell of the, the more consistent convention lower price business against the, the weekend and, uh, and, and tourism season fills that we'll get from the families. Thank you. Anything else? Alderman Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Part of what you just said basically answered what I was, basically answered what I was thinking, part of what you just said. When you mentioned room rates would be somewhat lower, and I can see where a convention center, you would want that. A lot of companies, when they send their people out, they don't want to pay maximum rates. But the money that those people spend when they come into that convention center, if you have a 1,000 people coming into a 183-room <coughs> hotel, a lot of them go by themselves. Some may share a room, but you're still going to have 600 people looking for rooms elsewhere in the community. And those people go out to eat all over. They go out to the bars. They go to the malls. They do shopping here. I think the overspill is tremendous, and, and I think you do need a convention center in, in a situation like this. And I don't think it's unique. I've been to the KI Center, McCormick Place, Milwaukee, and, and their convention centers, and uh, they're great things. But they are a draw, and, and you don't make money in the convention center itself. You make it throughout the community and around the community from the people going to the convention. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, first of all, I was excited from this project from the start, a little worried when I read our draft here. Very excited about what you're presenting here, and I certainly hope it works. Uh, I think what you say is true. Cities have to provide the investment for convention centers. That's just the way the market goes. But I want everybody to understand where the city gets part of the return on this convention center is actually closing down the armory. We get, uh, what, 30 or 35 days of uh, free use of this to take place of events that are currently at the armory. And the city will be in a hole if you approve this and then decide to keep the armory open. They go hand in hand. Um, uh, armory is a nice building, but it's sucking a lot of money out of the city. And that's part of the, the return on this convention center is actually closing the armory. So I just want the public to understand that and the aldermen to understand that because if you, if you vote for this and then don't vote to close the armory, uh, you're not following the, what the project's intended for. Thank you. Thank you. And, and another comment that I would like to, to bring up again is that um, the city-owned convention center is being paid for 100 percent by taxes that are generated by the project, that the resort project, that if the resort project never happens, there is no convention center. It, it, it's not as if it's just a check being written out of the general fund. Uh, it, it is a project. The project, we're fortunate in that this type of product um, generates so much in real estate taxes and so much um, in bed taxes that they do generate the op opportunities to, to fund projects like this convention center. Anything else, Alderman Ports? Alderman Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one more final question. I guess I'm going to spin it off of Alderman Schultz's uh, question. And I'm a little puzzled here. Uh, we're saying that the convention center is being proposed to be built because the city wants it. And we're saying that Great Lakes feels that it doesn't make any money, so Great Lakes didn't want to build it. But I understand the whole picture. Now I also heard that it's very critical that if we eliminate that portion of the development plan, and you guys don't want it. So if, if it's that critical, then why does the city have to own it and lease it back to you for a dollar a year for 99 years? Why won't you just ask for the money from the city and pay us for it after it's done? Why wouldn't you want to bill it as part of your package, as part of your package that, uh, that you're invested? Why does the city Because the numbers it? don't work. The the convention center requires capital to build it, and our capital requires return to investors and cost of debt. As a standalone business, as I tried to communicate before, uh, the cost of developing as a standalone business does not operate, does not generate enough return as a business. The resort, however, 
needs the rooms that are generated by that facility to be financially feasible. So without the convention center, the resort doesn't work. Without the resort, there's no money to build the convention center. They're really so closely married that you can't have either without the other, but together they work great. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And I think Steve will get into indirectly the resort is paying for the hotel, even though the city's putting up the money up front. Any other questions from the alderman? I guess before I move on, any questions, Mike, from any of your group? Because um, again, it's a joint venture. Let's please limit it to anything about the project. We'll get into the development agreement portion and some of the financing portions from Steve. But if somebody has a question about the any of the uh, boards or questions of these gentlemen about what it's going to look like or anything. How many stories high is it be? The question uh, was how many stories high since she doesn't have a mic. Uh, the resort will be three and a half stories high. The areas, the public core areas are three stories high. They're ramped up actually to, to provide better views at the lobby level. And then the wings are four stories high. Mike, Mike, can you move up to Mike? Move up to the mic. Can you move up to the mic without killing yourself? Thank you. Boy, that was work. Uh, hopefully, my question is a little easier than that. Uh, in, in, just in regards to the movement of people from the interstate to the to the lakefront, and I believe I've heard in previous uh, presentations that you've typically built these resorts on a major interstate. Uh, so the first part of my question is, you know, how do you anticipate doing that? And then once you move these people down to the lakefront, uh, have you studied the infrastructure uh, and the infrastructure that we have currently? Does it adequately meet your needs? And are you comfortable with that? We, we have. We are comfortable with that. We realize that, as you said, our resorts typically are on high um, visibility locations. We also realize that most of the people who stay with us come from a long ways away. We are a destination, we're not, we're not a drive-by demand destination. When people come to one of our resorts, they make their mind up before they get in the car. So what we're doing is focusing more on uh, the marketing end of this and the merchandising end of this and getting the consumers aware that the product exists and want to come there. And then we've budgeted marketing budgets for the project accordingly. Another nice thing, <laughs> even though uh, resorts like this you know, generate a lot of economic activity, they are relatively low trip generators. Uh, for traffic, and the city has a pretty pretty decent infrastructure as far as we can tell um, getting into here. Uh, this, this resort is far less um, uh, traffic intensive than a fast food facility, than retail, than places that have a lot of traffic in and out during the day. Uh, commonly when we've built resorts in other communities, it's very common to have to do traffic studies, and the general result has been that the communities, if they do have traffic problems, are glad a resort's coming in because it has a comparatively low impact on their traffic situation. Great, thank you. Need any help? <laughs> How many people do you plan to employ to staff this uh, project? What, what our experience has been in our past resorts has been that we've had approximately one employee uh, per guest unit, one being full-time, one being half-time. And based on the scope of this project, which is 200 and 40 some odd uh, units, we would typically expect about 240 employees. However, because of the city project uh, with the convention center and the restaurant, it'll be higher than that. I'll have to staff a complete full service restaurant, banquet operations. I, I don't know an exact number. I'm sure our operations staff could get that, but it'll be excess of 300. Any other questions from the Redevelopment Authority? Okay. I think what we'll do now is, if we can move the boards to the side, but I appreciate if you'd keep them up. If we could just you know, slide them to the sides of the room. We'll have the staff here now go through some of the uh, actual agreement and explain a little bit how some of this is gonna work and what our next steps are and where we'll go from here. So. I guess Steve. Uh, first, I need to point out that, uh, as we mentioned, 
over a week ago now that the, the copy of the contract that was handed out at the last council meeting was a draft and uh, uh, there have been changes to that draft and there will be more changes to that draft um, and we're not prepared tonight to present you with the with a revised draft uh, we're hopeful that uh, at the next council meeting on Wednesday that we'll be able to hand out a revised draft uh, with the hope that uh, we'll go over that revised draft on next Monday as a committee of the whole. Um, I think it'd be more fruitful to go over more of the specific items once we have that revised draft because there have been uh, a number of changes uh, but I think it, it would be helpful tonight to go over kind of a general overview a general outline of what's in the the current uh, the the draft that was presented to you as well as what will carry forward into future drafts because the uh, the basic kernel of the the project has not really changed uh, significantly in the, since we started meeting, I think back last July or August. Um, uh, we've had a couple prior meetings with the council, uh, one of which we, we had kind of a project overview and closed session, uh, and the alderman and I, I think the redevelopment authority was uh, in on that meeting as well. Really, the project overview is pretty consistent with uh, where we still are. Uh, some of the details, a lot of the details have changed as uh, uh, Tom and Mark uh, from Great Lakes have indicated. The project is, has evolved and continues to evolve. Uh, there's twists and turns. Uh, there's issues that come up. Um, and we're, you know, we're still addressing some of these uh, the most recent one with the increased proposed increased size of the conference center convention center um, and the request for the city to uh, provide more investment into the project um, that's new since the last draft of the agreement um, but in essence the the agreement itself uh, we anticipate it would be basically the same format as what you had and uh, I'll go over that format with you. I touched on this at the council meeting but I'll go in and spend a little more time with it. Uh, if as I go along you, uh, the council or the redevelopment authority has questions feel free to ask. If, uh, if what I'm covering you don't want to hear, if you want to hear uh, other things uh, let me know. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have a good draft for you to look at tonight, but uh, that's the nature of this project. Again, I'm hopeful that we uh, will later on this week and that we can discuss uh, a better draft uh, at the next meeting on next Monday. But the, uh, the basic overview of the document is that uh, there's a project overview in the first section that describes basically what uh, Mark and Tom described as as the project There's three major components the uh, uh, resort site which contains the hotel uh, which is 180 rooms or suites there's the condominium component which is 64 units uh, broken up into uh, four unit buildings two-story buildings and the, there's the uh, convention center restaurant uh, component that uh, in concept the uh, uh, will retain be retained in city ownership now all of the land on the rice coal peninsula is owned by the redevelopment authority currently and um, the concept is that we won't sell any of the land on the redevelop on the uh, on the peninsula that will enter into ground leases for that property. Um, so the 
the concept here is a 99 year ground lease to uh, the developer for the hotel portion and the uh, condominium site portion and that the uh, city and or redevelopment authority would maintain ownership of the convention center portion of the site. Steve, just one quick question that came to mind. On the other side of the river, the riverfront area, the Livesey buildings, things like that, we have the same type of arrangement over there where the city has retained the property underneath all the buildings and we have land leases with all those same developers in the same way where the city has kept control of the actual properties. So it's consistent with what we've done all throughout that development. Uh, yes, it is. The, uh, all the riverfront on the other side of Sheboygan River is uh, owned by the uh, Redevelopment Authority as well. Uh, some parcels owned by the city. Uh, the Livesey parcel is owned by the Redevelopment Authority and leased on, on the ground leases. Um, uh, most of those are 85-year ground leases. These are proposed to be 99-year uh, 99-year ground lease. But, the same basic concept, and the concept has been over the years that uh, this riverfront property is uh, is very valuable to the city, and in the long run, we feel it's in the city's best interest to maintain ownership uh, over that property so that the, the, uh, while it may be a perception more than reality, uh, the city will have more control over over the site long term. Uh, all in present. Those, 80, those uh, leases that the city has on the other side of the, of the river, you said they're about 85 years. Is that for a dollar a year, too? Uh, no. M most of them are for uh, the equivalent of the, uh, the taxes on the land. And, and uh, I would say average like $1,200 a year. Now, none of those, other than the harbor winds, generate room taxes. But. Thank you. Uh, a little competition. Uh, I'm on a record, of course, objecting to the 99-year releases. Uh, I also know I'm not going to get that change, so I guess I have to live with it. Uh, I guess one of the problems I have, uh, originally, I've been on council for six years now, and started out with Bob Pierce and trying to buy this property. All the times it was proposed that we'd buy this land and then we would sell the land to get back some of our costs. Um, now maybe the economics of this development doesn't allow that, but I guess I have a problem that that was made without council's uh, approval because uh, certainly I thought we were going to be selling land. Uh, even if we gave away the land, we would then be getting property tax on it. Um, I wouldn't have a problem with a dollar a year lease to get the project going for a certain number of years. I just have a problem with it being a dollar a year for 99 years. Um, once this gets out of the TIF district, then whatever, whatever property tax we get, now it gets shared with the, the schools and the county and so on. Um, it's, I realize it's probably too late to do anything about it, but I certainly would have liked to have seen the lease, once the TIF district expired, produced more money than a dollar a year, and I think the council should have been informed up front when that decision was made that we were going to lease the land instead of selling it, and that's what I want to say about that. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess uh, one of the things I think, the 99-year lease doesn't bother me in, in, in the least for a lease. I, I look at a lot of things we do. Most of the places where we have long-term leases at a dollar per year are places that provide no tax revenue to the city at all. Kitty's Camp at a dollar a year, Literacy Council at a dollar a year, Blue Line Association at a dollar a year for a land lease, Sheboygan Child Care Center, uh, Sheboygan County Conservation at Maywood, Sheboygan Outboard Club, dollar a year, but they don't pay any taxes. This development will be paying taxes on the building and the properties on a value of over $41 million, and I think that makes up the difference quite handsomely, and it also ensures that the city in the future, 99 years from now, 
if this building should fall apart and need to be replaced, still owns the land it's on. The city still has control of what goes there, and I like having that option. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for Steve, I've had a lot of people that I talked to in the last couple of weeks, and I've been talking to people everywhere, ask, and maybe you can clarify this for them, what is the Redevelopment Authority, who are they, and what the heck is a TIF district? There's an awful lot of people out there that don't know, and maybe you could just give us a simple explanation for the people listening on television. Sure, Alderman uh, Wangerman. Redevelopment Authority is a uh, separate uh, legal and political governmental body created by the city council uh, for the purpose of urban renewal and redevelopment. Uh, the statutes allow for either uh, two different types of uh, agencies. Uh, the redevelopment authorities are, uh, have been around longer and that's what the, the city has had a redevelopment authority uh, I don't know how far back it goes, probably at least 20 years. Uh, uh, I'm sure longer than that before my time. Uh, the statutes provided more recently for community development authorities, CDAs as opposed to RDAs, which uh, are kind of a combination of what the city has currently with the redevelopment authority and the housing authority, which we have as a separate organization. Under a CDA, you can have a housing authority and redevelopment authority sort of under one agency. Uh, City of Sheboygan has two. We've got a separate housing authority, which uh, owns buildings and uh, uh, rents, uh, rents facilities to uh, low and moderate income uh, tenants. Uh, the, the statutory purpose of the redevelopment authority is just that. Its jurisdiction is redevelopment of blighted areas within a city. Uh, uh, the statutes provide that uh, once you have a redevelopment authority, the jurisdiction for redevelopment goes to the redevelopment authority and is taken from the city council. So it's really the redevelopment authority that has jurisdiction over redevelopment projects. Now, uh, saying that uh, that's legally the case, as a practical matter, the redevelopment authority uh, has its source of revenues and funding from the city and the city council. So uh, the city council statutorily has to approve redevelopment authority projects and funding for redevelopment authority projects. So the, uh, the council still maintains the purse strings, if you will, for redevelopment authority developments. Um, was there another? TIF. Oh, uh, TIF. TIF districts. A mysterious uh, TIF district. Uh, TIF is tax incremental financing, and uh, most most states have uh, some mechanism for TIF districts. Some states call them port districts, but uh, what what they are is a, a mechanism in which a community, a city, or village can uh, put money into a project within a defined boundary. And as an incentive for doing that, uh, for a period of time, recoup all the incremental taxes that are generated by projects that, that develop within that tax incremental district. Uh, typically, when you don't have a, a TIF district, uh, a property owner receives a tax bill that the taxes that are paid go uh, some to the city, the city gets roughly 25% of the taxes. Some go to the school district, some go to the county, some go to the Lakeshore Technical uh, District or the technical district in the community. Uh, when you have a TIF district during that statutory period of time that the TIF district is in effect, uh, all the incremental taxes from development, and when I say incremental taxes, I mean those uh, the increase in the tax base from uh, after the creation of the district, all those taxes go just to the city during a window, statutory window of time uh, to help recoup the city's uh, 
uh, infrastructure expenses and, and money that goes into the tax incremental district to try to generate the development. Uh, so it's really a financing mechanism for communities to help them uh, uh, rehab rehab areas and uh, and get development. Uh, in this case, th this this part of TIF District Six, which includes the marina, uh, some of other parts of downtown, and it's not a new TIF district. It's not being created just for this project. Um, and it's one, one of the uh, obstacles we're facing here is this TIF district has been in place for some time and its life expectancy is due to expire in 2018. Uh, so we don't have a very long period. Typically you have 25, 23 to 27 years in which to recoup your investment in a TIF district. Here we're down to uh, about 15 years left in the district, so investment by the city currently in the Rice Peninsula uh, isn't able to be recouped for as long a time as if we were to have a new TIF district. Uh, we are out of capacity, so we couldn't create a new TIF district, uh, couldn't dissolve this and create a new one because uh, we're out of capacity. Uh, we did get um, legislative help a couple years ago, which extended the uh, city's ability, the time frame in which to uh, expend project costs or project dollars in a TIF district uh, that can be recouped uh, until 2004, the end of 2004. So we've got that period of time in which to, to expend our public dollars that get recouped in the TIF. Uh, I'd also say we're working on legislation or a possible legislative change to try to uh, see if we can't get the TIF district, in this case, extended from the 2018 date out uh, four or five more years. But that's definitely not a sure thing, and we're not banking on that in this project. Thank you very much. It's uh, just two points that an awful lot of people were confused about and uh, really don't understand, and it, I thank you for your explanation. Well, I, I would say uh, there are, as uh, the Great Lakes folks indicated, there are two components of our ability to recoup our investment, the city's investment in this project. One is through tax incremental financing increments, the, the, the property taxes generated. The other is through the room tax. Uh, we've, as you know, we recently increased the city room tax to 8%. The proposal here is to uh, capture the entire room tax generated from this project to pay for the convention center uh, and restaurant and a public component parking area and so forth for this project. Uh, so. You know, we're not basing everything just on the property tax, but also the room tax. And the statutes allow uh, use of room tax for convention centers. Back to you. Okay. Uh, getting back to the agreement, I mentioned the project overview gives uh, somewhat of a summary of the uh, the project. The second section is a definition section that has defines all the terms in the agreement that are defined terms. Uh, third section is the commitments. It basically says that uh, the resort LLC, uh, that's, that is the entity that Great Lakes companies uh, proposes to create that will uh, develop and operate the, uh, the resort. We'll construct, furnish, and equip the resort project and the convention center project. And the condominium LLC, uh, this is, will be a separate uh, single asset limited liability company that um, the uh, people in the Great Lakes companies will set up. 
uh, at its cost and expense will construct, furnish, and equip the condominium project. And the city at its cost and expense will construct and install the public improvements. The authority at its cost and expense, that's the redevelopment authority, will make the uh, authority loan. That's what's referred to as the $11.2 million loan in your version of the agreement. And uh, as you heard, the uh, proposal is to up that by a million dollars to roughly 12.2 million uh, now with the expanded convention center. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Steve, would you please explain again for the public uh, what an LLC really is? And there's other questions going around the community. What is an LLC and how does that, how does that LLC play, what role does it play underneath the, uh, the Great Lakes? I understand that they're going to be created by Great Lakes for a single purpose right underneath them. An LLC is uh, the type of company that statutes allow for and have been uh, very popular uh, since the statutes were amended maybe 10 years ago to uh, to allow for limited liability companies and that's exactly what they are they're they're companies that uh, uh, can be created that limit the liability of uh, of that entity to to that entity basically uh, uh, it's intended that these will be single asset companies uh, that will have as their asset either the condominium project or the resort project. Uh, and uh, it, the benefit to that uh, creation of a limited liability company for the, the principals or the members, as they're called, is that uh, it limits their personal liability. And uh, the liability is limited to that corporate entity. I'll live in ports. Thank you. Uh, well, living liability, liability companies are a very common thing to put real estate in nowadays. That's a common practice. Uh, in reading this document, I also was under the impression that they're also giving personal guarantees. So if uh, there would be a default, they also have some liability, whereas if it was just a, a limited liability company without the guarantees, there wouldn't be. Um, it's a common practice. You put the building in a limited liability company and the operating business probably in a corporation or an S corporation and then separate the two so if the business goes bad it, it doesn't cause, cause the building to go with it. But uh, um, the fact that there's personal guarantees is what makes me happy about this. A limited liability company just on its own leaves it kind of hanging dry. I appreciate you doing your homework. You read well. Oh, I got lots of questions. <laughs> is, is what he said true, Steve, in the fact that there's some personal backup? Yes, uh, and maybe we can turn to that part of the agreement, the guarantee portion. Um, again, the, uh, the draft you've got, and I don't have that draft right in front of me, but I've got... Well, now I do. I think it's on page 25 of the copy that you've got entitled Guarantees, paragraph 11. Uh, now, all this language isn't necessarily cast in stone yet. There's, there may be some changes in here, but basically the, the concept is that the, uh, the guarantors will guarantee the monetary obligations under the reimbursement agreement. Now, I've, since we've skipped to paragraph 11, we've skipped over the reimbursement agreement, but basically what that is, and I, I wasn't able from this vantage point to see the numbers in that chart that uh, the Great Lakes folks have put up, but that uh, is a later version of what you had as the attachment to the document that had the two components of the reimbursement payments there's a real estate tax component and a room tax component that was in the, the exhibit that was attached to the version you got, I believe, uh, to come to a total uh, reimbursement payment that's an annual payment that um, Great Lakes Company and the developer is 
uh, or the resort LLC is required to make, uh, currently we're talking about uh, on every October 1st, starting in 2005. Well, I think payments start in 2005. Uh, an annual payment that they, they guarantee that they will make. And that guaranteed payment, they get credit for the uh, room taxes generated and the real estate taxes generated. But if they come up short, that's got to come out of their pocket. Uh, now, how do we guarantee that if they come up short that they've got it in their pocket to pay? That's where we've got these guarantees under paragraph 11. And there's, there's various levels. There's, uh, as Alderman Ports mentioned, there's personal guarantees of, uh, of individuals in Great Lakes Company. There's a guarantee of Great, by Great Lakes Company, Inc. There is a, a reserve fund that is $500,000, and that's, that will be made up by the room taxes generated in 2004, whatever those might be, uh, plus whatever it takes to reach half a million dollars. So that reserve fund will be half a million dollars um, that Great Lakes will come up with Currently, they've been talking with the, the Friends of Sheboygan uh, with the, uh, their hope that the Friends of Sheboygan will assist Great Lakes in coming up with the balance of that $500,000 reserve fund. But that's, uh, that's another level of uh, a pot of money that would be set aside in the event of uh, inability to make, make the payments under the reimbursement agreement. Then there's also a... Uh, what's it called, a guarantee deposit of $1 million that would be put up by the developer, held in escrow, um, in the event that there's default in payments under the reimbursement schedule. Um, so there's various levels of guarantees here. Uh, in, a, in addition, and I don't think it's in the guarantee section, it's in the condominium section, uh, there's provision for uh, setting aside a, an escrow fund of a million dollars for the condominium development. Now, originally, the condominiums, and this goes back early on in the project, uh, the condominiums... Uh, we're going to be part of the resort project and basically one project. As it evolved, uh, the, the developer is getting, uh, having separate lenders for the, the resort project and the condominium project. And um, their, their lenders are placing a uh, pre-sale requirement on the condominiums that they have to pre-sell. Um, the condominiums uh, um, so that they can get enough money to build uh, or, or so uh, they'll get a loan for twice that to build uh, for every unit they pre-sell they'll get uh, loans to build two units um, so the developer also is going to uh, finance the condominiums through a public security sale they're treating these the condominium units basically as a, an investment vehicle. Uh, as uh, Tom and Mark mentioned, they're going to be owned by an owner, but uh, going to be a limit to maximum of 60 days a year that the owner can use them as their as their own. The rest of the time, they've got to be in the in the hotel pool, and, and will be generating uh, room taxes and uh, income to the resort just like hotel rooms. So they're marketing them as, as investment vehicles. 
Because of that, they've got to go through a number of public securities offering procedures that is going to delay their ability to finance the condominium component. So uh, the condominiums aren't likely going to start at the same time as the resort and are kind of on a different track. The issue is uh, the developer says they're going to build 64 condominiums. What happens if they don't, don't sell that many? Uh, we've tried to address that by in the uh, in the condominium section by providing for a million dollar escrow that would basically be there until uh, that's in section 40 of your agreements on page 56 uh, and the the mechanisms for for the condominium development and the phasing have changed somewhat since your draft, but the concept's still the same. Be an escrow amount put in place up front by the developer that uh, once they get 32 units built, will uh, be paid back to the developer uh, at, at roughly 132nd of the million per additional condominium built. Uh, and if, if they don't build condominiums, uh, that money goes back to the City and Redevelopment Authority, and but does count towards their, uh, their reimbursement payments uh, if, if they don't make payments. Uh, so that's another level of protection on the condominium side. The Steve, did we need a, again, because it's two different LLCs, that's why we have two different million dollar type of agreements that to back those up so they each cover their own LLC? Somewhat. Let me fix it. You want to grab that one? Uh, somewhat. The, the main thing is that it's for a different purpose, I guess. It's... It's uh, insurance that the condominiums get built. All the reports. Uh, as I read this document, I had uh, many questions, and as I read further, a lot of them were, were answered to me. That to sign a good document that it answers questions. Uh, but these guarantees, I, had, I found quite interesting. Um, the half a million dollar guarantee is actually being funded with the room tax dollars. It's like us giving the money for the guarantee. When I read that, I thought, well, I didn't think I liked that idea so much. And it also made me reread the document to see what else I didn't, didn't like. I didn't pick up, when I first read the million dollar guarantee on the other project, that was an issue to me. but. And going back and rereading it after looking at we're funding the one guarantee with room tax dollars, which is city money, the condominium guarantee is withholding a million dollars of the loan and putting that in a guarantee fund. And then if they don't build it, we get 164 for, for each time. So again, it appears to me that the guarantee money is being put up by the city. Um, that doesn't sit well with me. I, I, maybe I'm missing something there. Uh, also in the guarantees, if they're short on the property tax or the room tax guarantee in year one, two, three, or four, whatever, they have to come up with it. But if there's an excess in future years, they get paid back their guarantee. And that, again, didn't make much sense to me. Uh, they're supposed to be guaranteeing that the project's going to produce 41 million of, of uh, assessed value. And if they don't hit it at the start, I don't understand why they should be paid pay back out of, out of future profits. So those are the, my biggest concerns. Uh, the half a million dollar guarantee funded by our room tax is really what set me off on this document. As I said in the beginning, I was for, for this project. I'm excited about it now. But I felt like they were trying to pull the wool over my eyes by giving a guarantee that's funded with our money. 
Um, maybe somebody can explain the logic of that to me, but why are the 2004 room tax dollars being deposited in a fund as a guarantee versus yeah, using yeah. to pay off debt or something else which would seem more logical to me and I, I just don't see the other, other thing and that uh, I maybe I just don't get it but uh, that maybe really wonder about the whole project when we have so-called guarantees but the city is putting the money in for the guarantees. Well, unfortunately, Rich Gephardt's not here tonight. But he, he could perhaps uh, address some of these issues. But the uh, the reserve fund, the five hundred thousand uh, dollars, that's been the discussions. Is that would be comprised of the room tax generated in two thousand four, uh, if any. And I guess the issue is um, the project has to be up and running. Uh, to generate room tax, and uh, you know, it's really an unknown as to what that amount will be. the The financing has been structured so that uh, the developer wouldn't have to make any payments on the guaranteed payment until 2005. So uh, it was felt that the whatever room taxes were generated could be put in a fund to help. Uh, cover in the event that there was a, a, a shortage later on. Uh, also, the, the balance of the 500000 uh, would come out, you know, whatever uh, the room tax uh, comes up short of 500000 and it probably will come up short of 500000 in 2004, will be made up by the developer uh, and the developer uh, through, uh, through the Friends of Sheboygan would make up the balance of that. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the staff wants to address that. I, get to, I just wanted to say one thing is that, that that first million is cash from the developer. And then the second or the, the second gear, cash guarantee is that 500000 and that's a room tax with the friend. So that million dollars is in place first. And if I, I think in our discussions, the million dollars, they're putting up a million dollars cash um, at the time of closing. So prior, no. right, up front, that was changed. Yeah, not closing. That was changed. Yeah. That was one thing that was insisted upon was that it was at closing. Oh. Correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, so th there is a million dollars up front of their money first in the first level, I believe. Is that what you were saying? Yes. But, and then there's then the contract you're working on now. Correct. And then the second backup is the half a million of the room tax. And I think the thought there was because our loans don't kick in until 2006 that we have to start payment, it was better to put some of that money away for the rainy day type of fund in case we run into a problem, then try to start paying off things immediately. Okay, but the, the TIF, we have to put money into this TIF now. <coughs> yeah, you know, right now we have, uh, I think it's money's coming from TIF on which going to expire at, I don't know, 2006 or whatever. Uh, so we have to put in money to fund the TIF when it's short, and we got up to 500000 of our, our own money sitting in this account, which when the TIF aspires and everything goes right, we get the, get the money. Anyways, it's our money. Uh, I guess to me, instead of having that reserve account, I'd rather have the 300, whatever the room tax is, being used to pay off the TIF debts. And I, I just don't understand the logic of the, the reserve account funding it with our own money. Come to the Finance Committee on Monday and argue with Rich over that. But he felt it was more important, you know, if, the state got into a problem by not having a rainy day fund, and I think they're looking at, you know, to to make as much insurances that this project's not going to be put on the burden on the taxpayers' backs from from this pro project was to fund these things with as many safety nets in, as possible to try to eliminate any any future problems if they were to arise. I believe, but. That's one thing that will be discussed. You know, the actual financing numbers 
will be discussed at Finance Committee next Monday, so we can come back with the actual $2,272.32 type numbers. Right now we're talking in generalities, but that was the concept anyways, to, was to put money away for that. And then also room tax dollars can only be used for tourism promotion and development. So it doesn't necessarily mean that those excess room tax dollars can go towards paying off other debt. Okay. Well, now that makes sense to me. But I agree. Well, that's that. a good reason then. Yeah. You know, it, it, but, but when it expires, that room tax dollars goes to the city. And how does that apply then? If you read the agreement, at the end of 2016 or whenever the date is, uh, if the 500000 is touched, the friends get back their portion, and the city gets back their portion of, of the uh, room tax dollars. Uh, does that follow? I believe the room tax will go on forever, but you'll still have to be within the state statutes of how you use that room tax at a later date once the convention center is paid off. So when, it, when, when that fund aspires, we'll, we'll be restricted on what we can use that room tax for? Just like we are now. And room taxes can only be used for celebrations for um, tourism and tourism convention and promotion. So you will be, re those dollars, even though we've paid off the convention center, will still be coming in, but they will be restricted under state law. Okay, thank you. I don't know who was next. Alderman um, Eberg. Yes, I think it was Jim, I guess just for clarification. The million dollars letter of credit guarantees the, the TIF increment. Then there's a $5 million or, and change, a five-year loan that basically we provide to the developer uh, in terms of a note or a bond that's paid back in five years. The question I have also is how long are we out bonding for the convention center? Because where is our money coming from? Uh, Alderman Berry, I'm not sure what you're talking about, the five-year repayment. The, the, the concept is, as it currently is, would be it would all be treated as a redevelopment authority loan, the 11.2 or the $12.2 million. And it's the repayment schedule for that would be based on, would be that chart, that uh, table, uh, payments through, I think, 2028. Uh, and, you know, portions of that, the, the TIF component would be paid off in 2018 and the room tax component would go longer. But Originally, weren't we looking at a short-term loan for about five years to be paid back? Wasn't that one of the original? I think, I think you're talking about the, the mechanism that the city uses to borrow the funds. Correct. Uh, that's really a rich question. Uh, okay. uh, and that's, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, as to how he structures the financing to, to loan the developer the 11-2 uh, or the 12-2. That, uh, but that's, that's a different question than repayment by the developer of the 11-2 or 12-2. We, we issue short-term bans before we go out for the bonding mm -hmm. and then roll that over yes. in order to cover the cost of the interest and things. The convention center though, that five million or four point whatever million, the convention center is actually gonna be, will be driven by the room tax dollars, not the TIF dollars. True, but still, we, we go out and bond for that money. We bond for that 20, money, right. Would that be a 20 year or do we have any, I guess I'd like to have some sense of- I think we're not, we're not hung up I think we're still going out with a 20-year, because we're bonding it all together. Okay. So it's going to be a 20. But we're not in the same, I don't think we're in the same, because the TIF ends in 2018. The room tax doesn't end in 2018. Right. So the, you could extend the bonding for the convention center longer than that, but the dollars that are being going to be generated actually do take care of that in that same amount of time. And the guarantees that they're guaranteeing on those dollars will pay off those loans under the original concept, I believe, if that's your question. That's my question. Did we confuse you now? And that's <laughs> Alderman Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
I actually received the answer to my question already, so I don't need to proceed with that one. And that, well, I turned you off. Yeah, and that involved a half a million dollars that that uh, room tax would cover for 2004. And it, that'd be my understanding; they would have to actually generate that much room tax in seven months, basically from June 1st to the end of the year, in order to fill it. And if they didn't, they would put the balance in. Is that still a factor in there? Right. So, right, they or whatever. It's not the city. Right. Clear on the questions? Okay. Uh, getting back to the document, uh, on section four ownership, uh, as said before, the concept is the redevelopment authority would own the land and would lease the component portions. Uh, City would own the public improvements going out there, the streets, uh, and so forth. Uh, the next several sections of the agreement uh, discuss in the terms that and conditions that would be in the the sub agreements to the development agreement, and those are paragraph five that deals with the resort ground lease. Paragraph six, I believe, deals with the condominium ground lease. Paragraph seven. You're talking about uh, infrastructure. What is the infrastructure going to cost us? Uh, turn that over to Tom Holt. Uh, right now, we're still working on the numbers and going through the final design about uh, the promenade, we're looking at two to two and a half million dollars for along the whole river. And we're looking at about four and a half million for streets, uh, sewers, sidewalks, street lighting, trees. How about uh, along the river there, that metal we put up all along, how much did that cost? That's, that was uh, 1.7 million uh, for the seawall through a, a no interest loan. And also the demolition is three hundred thousand dollars. The demolition and remediation work that's going on down there. The beach work. The beach work for that eco trail, the beach restoration, will be a million five. Is that in the grant? There, about a hundred and sixty thousand is a grant. The balance is borrowed uh, this year under capital improvements, or will be. Or might even borrowed. Was it borrowed last year? Mm -hmm. It was borrowed last year. Thank you. I'm impressed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up question on that, I think I've got a question on the ownership. Uh, being, uh, keeping in mind the budget shortfalls that we're, they're waiting for us, where's all that money going to come from for the infrastructure? Coming out of the, the TIF itself being paid for through the increment generated in the TIF. And, and for the street uh, and utilities and uh, promenade is through the room tax generation. And that's been factored into the whole package there? Yes. Okay. On, uh, if I may just go back a little bit on the ownership here. Uh, page 10, towards the bottom, the fourth line, each individual purchaser will receive a percentage interest in the ground lease. That means there's going to be tax free to property, each uh, individual owner of each condo. Is that what it means, Pete? Sorry, uh, it means what, uh, all the uh, purse? Each Individual purchaser, purchaser will receive the percentage interest in the ground lease, which means that if Terry buys a, a condo, he doesn't have to pay taxes on the property either. No, that's not true. The, the, lease, the leaseholders will have to pay property taxes. They will. Yeah, uh, that's, that's one of the advantages of the redevelopment authority. When the redevelopment authority leases land for redevelopment, uh, the, the lessee pays taxes just as though it were real estate owned. If it's different from when the city leases land, uh, there's, it's not taxable because the city isn't taxed, but uh, the statutes allow, the redevelopment authority uh, allow taxes to pass through to the lessee of a ground lease. So uh, all these ground leases will be taxed. That's what, uh, that's where the tax revenues are being generated from for this project is these leases based on the value of the improvements. 
and the uh, and the land value. On the conference center, us leasing it back to them, there will be some payment in this type of a manner for that too. And I think this is this is maybe more an assessor question, but my understanding is is the the uh, water park, the resort, the conference center, the restaurant. It's it look it's looked at as one project, and it's first assessed on the cost approach, and then assessed on the income approach. So the income that's tr generated in that conference center impacts the tax that they pay on the resort. And Maria is shaking her head yes in the back, so you must have hit it right on the head. So they will be paying some taxes even on the, f so the $1 lease, while it sounds like a $1 lease, we are able to generate taxes from that. It's not just $1. That was my question. And that's what I was trying to get, make, get somebody to say up here. <laughs> Alderman Ports. Thank you. Uh, let's follow up on Alderman Perez's questions. Uh, as they said in their presentation, their gar guarantees cover the, the cost of the city loans. It doesn't cover the infrastructure. They said best case scenario would be that they would cover their share of the infrastructure costs, which is roughly one third of, of the property. That's best case scenario. The infrastructure costs that you refer to are not built into this, but they are projecting greater uh, accessible values than the minimum guarantees, which would help to, to pay for that. But they're, they're not in this project. Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding this condominium lease. What my view of it is, is they're going to be taxed on the value of the condominium building. They're not going to be taxed on the value of the land. And then that's one of the problems I have with the condominiums is you have a dollar lease for the land, you got 64 condominiums. That means each condominium owner is paying about one and a half cents for the land every year. Now, if I'm misunderstanding that, let me know because I pay tax on my building my house and I pay tax on my, my land and my house system. I, I figured it out. Uh, my uh, uh, success at 35000 I pay $1,035 a year on my land. And they're paying a penny and a half each condominium owner or less. I'm totally misunderstanding something. I understand that they're going to pay on the building but the one and a half cents per condominium union, unit doesn't seem uh, fair to me. And that's one, you know, oh, that's there, there's two, two dollar a year le leases, one on the, the hotel part and one on the condominiums. And uh, clar clarify to me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, that's the way I see it. Well, I don't know if Marie could clarify that, but I, I think they would be taxed also on the value of the land. I mean. Uh, it's going to be land and building, even though the the underlying ground lease may only be a buck. The the value of that is going to be more than we're, that. We're talking the condominium unions, not the. So there will be a tax increment on the. Hey, Marie, could you? Come up to the microphone. <laughs> yeah, don't take the route that the Mike Glypam took. Uh. <laughs> the um, market value is based on the land plus the improvement, whatever a property would sell for. So the assessment would be both for land and in the improvement on the land. But they, they can't sell the land. Um, they would sell the unit that would include the interest in the land. Okay. So that would be the market value. And a part of that market value would be attributed to the land. In uh, assessing uh, property, you, 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 you look at the cost and you look at the income producing. Do you use the higher of the two or the lower of the two? We use the best market value, there are different approaches to use. One is the cost approach, one is the income, which is generally used just for income producing properties such as a hotel. And then we take a look at all the approaches and come up with the best one that is indicate, indicative of the value. And how do you determine what's the best? Um, according to statute, the market value is um, basically what a property would sell for. So what we take a look at is we use comparable properties 
and then take a look at all approaches and come up with the best one. Okay. So irregardless of how much money they stick in this property, if, you know, first year you have an assessment, and then if they don't fill their rooms or if they cut their, their room rates severely to fill their rooms, that's going to impact the assessment? Well, it's my understanding that there's a guaranteed payment. Right. But I mean, we're, we're, the numbers they present, presented showed uh, nice results above that guaranteed payment. Mm -hmm. That depends on them actually being able to sell their rooms or renting their rooms for the dollars they're hoping to get. Otherwise, they'll end up below the guarantee. Right. The assessment could be different than the guaranteed payment because the assessment we have to base it on market value and with the information that we have. Okay. But the guarantee is something that they have negotiated. Thank okay. Tom. I just have one clarification on Alderman Perez's question on the project. I look at the whole peninsula as the project. When Rich does his projections on the cash flow of the project, we're talking about the infrastructure and the whole peninsula. That's where the two and a half million for the promenade and the four and a half for the streets, that's for the entire uh, peninsula, not just the 17 acres. And that, Rich takes that into account and he's running his projections on that TIF and that whole area down there. If that's any clearer or not. So, so some of that cost is added to this project based on, on how much of the area of the overall peninsula and the overall, like say if this project takes up half of the peninsula, half of those costs would be contributed to this? Yes. Something similar to that. that ballpark. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Got lots of red lights. Alderman Wangaman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two questions, one for Mr. Holton. Uh, I've been asked by several people, will uh, John Q. Lunchbucket and his friends have access to the South Pier for fishing and uh, before, during, and after construction? And the second one is for the chair, but we'll get to that. There'll be access. There'll be access along Fisherman's Road uh, Temporarily, ultimately, the access will be through that main road that parallels the river, and you have that circular parking lot will be the new parking area for fishing. Uh, with hopefully uh, down the road, we have plans for a fish cleaning station, restrooms, and facilities out there, so it'll be an improved access uh, when the project's completed, being south the South Pier project. And I believe there's a green space area of, of park type to the corner, if you look on the w map on the wall. Up on that top is is all public access for again for fishing, um, fireworks type displays and park area in that outside of their um, facility, up to the south north north east. Second question: Will the chair entertain a motion for a five minute break? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why don't we take a five minute break and we'll get right back. Thank you. percent of the parking lot or just the portions of the convention center and what will that cost us we're paying for that portion as it relates to the conference center restaurant uh, which is roughly half that lot and I believe it was in the neighborhood of six hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars I don't don't look at me uh, we don't, that's numbers are top. We don't have a solid cost spread. I'm thinking it was six or seven hundred thousand for that uh, that half the parking lot. But the, it's being split between half being through the convention center and half being through the for the resort. Yes. The resort. Yes. And okay. Calling for. Then uh, just another portion of a question. Uh, of course, this money which we would be loaning, which is now up to what twelve million six hundred thousand something. Like that. So 
somewhere between 11.5 and 12.2, somewhere in there. Okay, now this is loan to them interest free, is that correct? Uh, that the document says it's interest free, but it it's it's not your typical loan where there's a a, a promissory note as far as payments. It's to be repaid pursuant to the reimbursement schedule, which, uh, as the numbers show, uh, exceed by quite a bit the the original loan amount over time. So, uh, you know, we're not just getting back $11.2 million or 12 to whatever the number is. We're getting back significantly more than that in the reimbursement payments. Okay. Then, uh, say, for instance, this company would fold within 12 years. What is our guarantees that we will still be continuing to get our, more or less, money back? Uh, this again is probably best a, a Rich Gephardt question, but general concepts with the uh, with the reserve fund and the guarantee deposit uh, of roughly a million and a half dollars, we're figuring that let's say the project folded and shut down completely, and so there was no room tax generated. Issue would be whether we could. You know, we could collect the real estate tax. Let's assume we couldn't, for for the sake of argument. Uh, there'd be a million and a half dollars, which would cover us on the reimbursement schedule for about 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, the total shutdown of no other income coming in, and uh, no other payments uh, by guarantors or anything. Uh, but the likelihood is that we've got. Uh, you know, banks banks involved here as far as the resort uh, lending goes, and banks involved in the condominium. Uh, the, the thought process is that uh, likely the bank would bring in another operator or developer uh, because it would be financially advantageous to the bank to do that uh, to get the facility up and running again within. A year or 18 months, uh, so that the income stream is being generated again, and the taxes are being uh, generated. So that that's kind of the thought process behind the stop cap of the of the guarantee deposit and the reserve fund. So then, if the financial institutions that uh, give the loans uh, more or less place liens on facilities, would we also be part of those liens? The, the the lender, we're agreeing in this agreement to subordinate our interest in the resort site and the condominium site to the the mortgage of the lenders on the resort project and the and the condominium project. So we'll be in second position to to the lenders there. Okay, I've got more questions <laughs> uh, for. Uh, Leasing the uh, uh, convention center, of course, we would lease this to them. Uh, will they pay us to manage it then, more or less? Uh, and what will we lease it to them for? Do we have any ideas yet? Uh, if you turn to section 7, the convention center operating agreement, the, uh, the way the document currently is, is for the life of this agreement, which uh, the term of this agreement is approximately 24 years ending uh, the end of 2028, that during that period that the, uh, the resort LLC, Limited Liability Company, would operate the convention center under an operating agreement uh, without paying lease payments to the city or the authority. Uh, but at the end of that period, uh, maybe you have the page, uh, and, and your, your copy, it's on page 15, uh, it provides for renewal options 
uh, to extend the convention center operating agreement for five years each for 15 option periods, which uh, the concept behind that is if all those options were exercised, roughly that's the 99 year lease term. Uh, but those options, there would be uh, the resort LLC would be required to make an annual payment to the city each year during those extension periods uh, in an amount that we don't know yet. It would be determined at that time uh, in good faith and reasonably uh, the parties negotiating that figure. And in the event that the parties are unable to agree on the amount of compensation for those uh, extension periods, that uh, there'd be uh, an arbitration panel from the American Arbitration Association would uh, render a decision as to what the lease agreement, at least payment would be during each of those periods. So uh, no, no lease payments currently on the operating agreement for the convention center, but on the renewals, there will be a payment as yet undefined as to what that is. But uh, the hope is that after a period of time, we'll have some, some idea of what's being generated by the convention center. We really don't know what that is right now. Um, by the time we get to 2028, hopefully we'll have a better idea of what uh, a reasonable figure would be. I have just one more yet, and this uh, will end it for me, at least for now. Uh, the contract, it does say that the city can use the convention center at no cost. And, of course, the general public, if they would lease it, would you know, pay whatever the going rate is. Of course, for us using it at no cost, we would still be charged for using the facility for setup, for cleaning, equipment rental, and what else? I mean, that's really not free anymore, is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Unless it was some city functions or whatever, then we'd have to work something out with the to use the tables. Or I'm guessing you're saying a table cost and things like that that right. may be associated, but there wouldn't be an actual two hundred dollars a day f rental fee. Besides that, we wouldn't be charged that. Correct. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Alderman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My first question uh, is, if the city is going to own the conference center and the developer manage it and no lease payments being made, uh, the property taxes, what becomes of, how is, do we get any property tax off of that facility? I think that's what Marie was trying to explain to us 15 minutes ago. Well, she was addressing the condos, though. This is the conference center. <clears throat> We're going to take a look at the whole. We're going to take a look at the income that is generated. And the income that would be generated from the conference center would be reported by the hotel and be considered as part of the value. So in essence, it will be part of the total value. Of the Yes. And thus taxable. When we, when we take a look at the value, we take a look at the income approach and the cost approach and the market approach, and in a project such as this, you basically use the income approach, and you look at all the income that's generated and base the value on that. That's one method of valuation. You take a look at the income and expenses and base your value on that. I mean, there's, there's more to the formula than that, but those are the basic ingredients. So the short answer is we will be receiving some tax off of the income that's generated through them running the conference center. That's correct. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, but I, and we seem to be asking a lot of questions. So I, I guess I'd like to go into this right now. Uh, I started out by saying, how can a lay person such as myself possibly determine if a 62-page document has every contingency covered? Many terms appear to be repeated more than once for the LLCs and projects, terms such as developer, resort, resort LLC, condominium LLC, uh, resort project, condominium project, and convention project with the same language referenced for all. Um, we have to trust the experts representing the city in a contract of this magnitude. And I guess the question for Ann, uh, the question that I have was, what was the role of Quarles and Brady in assembling this contract? Quarles and Brady is a pretty prestigious law firm. Uh, I, I guess I'm surprised and, and, and appreciative of the fact that we had Quarles and Brady. Uh, were they part of the negotiations or were they advisory or, um, you know, what? Was your role? Yes, uh, we. Can you use the mic on one? this. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, we were part of the negotiations representing the city. Um, I think we were at pretty much all of the meetings that the the city group um, had with the Great Lakes representatives. Uh, we did draft the document um, with input from everybody, um, all of the parties to the to the document. Okay. And then a question I have to everybody involved in assembling the contract, individually and as a group, does this limit the risk to the city? Absolutely, as much as possible. I am sure you feel it does, but the question needs to be asked to hear your response if there are any concerns on your part, either individually as a, or as a group, uh, with the contract. Is everybody thoroughly comfortable with it? I am. Why don't, why don't you start? <laughs> I don't. It would be nice to get somebody outside of the city's interest and in, in yes. to get start. I think, um, in answer to your question, uh, there are no safe havens. Um, there are going to be risks in any development you have, whether it's this development or any other development. There's always going to be some element of risk to the city with the development. I think that the People from the city and I, in negotiating this document, um, took uh, or worked very hard, very hard to minimize the risk to the city. Did we get everything we wanted? No. You never do in a negotiation. It's just not possible. It's it's the nature of the beast that there is give and take, and so you have to give on some points, and you you get on some points. I mean, it's it's just the way it goes. But I think we did our very best. Um, as I said, to minimize the risk to the city. Whether we accomplish that, whether the benefits of the development uh, and versus the risk, that's a, a judgment call and I think a policy decision that you're ultimately going to be called upon to make, taking into account everything you know about the history of the city and the site and, and the people involved. Could you maybe just elaborate on some of that risk that to the city? Oh, I think some of you have pointed out some of the risk. What happens if, um, I think Alderman Bauman said what happens if the developer goes out of business and the hotel goes dark? There's a risk there. Uh, what happens if um, all of the guarantee money is used? I mean, it's the, it's the kind of risk that you're asking questions about. I mean, I think you're recognizing, yes, that you, know, you can't have everything tied up in a neat little package. And you're asking, the questions you're asking are questions about, is there risk here? Is there not risk there? How much risk is there? And I think. Um, I think you're spotting the issues where there may be some risk, but I, um, you know, I, I don't know that I, I can see those any better than you can right. in that regard. Okay, thank you. Another one, has an economic analysis been done by an economist? We seem to have a lot of expert financial people, but would an economist prevent, present a different viewpoint? Uh, and I know uh, Paula being an economic, uh, or coming from an economic development um, area. And I think the representatives from Great Lakes mentioned that SDC had a market and feasibility study prepared and the project cash flowed based on the amount of hotel rooms, condominiums, and the conference center and the water park. And that's what the city looked at, I think it was back in September, and decided at that point to continue moving ahead. Since that time, there's been an update to that study, which I think you have some of the numbers in front of you, that actually showed that with the shift that they made in the amount of rooms and the condos, and with the market being basically the same for hotels, that 
they even increased that room tax revenue. Was and that the developer what? by four million, and the developer is standing behind that. And yeah, so that's the extra guarantee they're giving is on that four million. And this was an outside firm outside of the cities and the Great Lakes. This was somebody hired just for that reason. Yes. And that's why uh, I believe it was Mark that made the comment to my question that could the facility be successful without the conference center? They're, they're all somewhat linked mm -hmm. that one can't survive without the other. Okay. Also, are there safeguards in place to elim eliminate the potential for a city subsidy to the conference center? Um, you know, there's guarantees in here for some of the other aspects of it, but is there a possibility uh, that a subsidy would be required for the conference center? Um, and, and are there guarantees to avoid that? Nothing in the agreement currently that would uh, uh, provide for any additional monies put in by the city or the redevelopment authority into the into the project. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're asking Alderman Schultz whether 10 years from now, if the developer comes back and says, "Geez, uh, you know, this isn't cash flow, and we need more money," uh, whether whether that's some scenario that's possible that that they could do, I suppose they could. It's not contemplated in the agreement that uh, you know we're putting in the money up front, and that's all the money we're putting into it. You mentioned ten years. What about two years? Could they come back in two years and say that? The, uh, you know, well, they could. A potential they, there. they could come back at any time and say anything, I, I suppose. And you know, we could say no. Uh, we're not going to put any more money into it. I mean, the. The whole idea of going through all this is to try to address all the issues up front and and all the contingencies up front, and uh, and to address them up front. And uh, I don't contemplate the developer coming back to the city or the city saying, you know, we're going to put more money into the project. But could that happen? I I suppose it could, and uh, the issue would be then up up to you. But I, I don't see that happening. That's one of the risks that Ann mentioned. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, it does, you know, the, the agreement, our exposure is capped as far as our investment. If, if a developer starts constructing the project, costs twice as much as they thought, uh, our, our investment is limited to the 11-2 or the 12-2. It doesn't incrementally go up or anything if there's cost overruns. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Schultz. Alderman Manning. Thank you. A very simple question. Uh, proposed initial prices for the two-bedroom and four-bedroom condos. Uh, hearing those, we'll have a sense of what the tax income would be from those properties. And secondarily, we'd have a sense of how quickly they might be selling. Gentlemen, either one of you can answer that. Can you come up to the mic, please? Sure. <coughs> Sorry. Initial uh, price for the condos, two and four bedroom? I think we projected an average selling price of what? Mid to mid, mid, mid to high twos. Uh, so let's say we accomplish you know, 275 on average over the 64 units. And I think uh, you guys marked the market on your assessment if there's a, a sale at that amount. You said you then call an assessed value equivalent to the sale price. Is that how you establish it initially? We also consider the assessment ratio on there also. Okay. So I think it's it's pretty formulaic as to what happens after a sale happens. Uh, you know, 275 falling you know, average 2%. But, you know, that's 5,500 a year in taxes that are produced from the condos. Secondly, in terms of the timing of the sale, it's always hard to predict, but... We've got a pretty good guess. 
there's already a lot of interest in the condominiums. Uh, the uh, condo units in Wisconsin Dells, developers have been building them like crazy. Why? Because people have been buying them like crazy. We think that uh, having all of the unique elements, the water park, the quality of the resort we're going to build, and the lakefront combined, if they can sell uh, very, very quickly, I think we can sell equally quickly. In fact, it's our goal to sell all of the condominium units before the end of this summer if you can imagine that, and to sell them off of what are good, good plans. Um, that's certainly not what we've called for in the agreement. We have uh, penalties and protections built in for the city, but that's not what we believe is, is reality. So. That's your question. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, my question. Uh, pertains to the risk, and we've touched a little bit on, on the risk uh, issue here and there. Uh, right now, we seem to be thinking more in terms of pretty pictures and all the benefits. There was a full page ad in the paper explaining all the benefits of the program, uh, of the project. Uh, and I would, I would want us to, to uh, give this project uh, uh, more than casual consideration of all the risks that are involved, and we've talked about a few. But is there a way, and maybe this is a rich question, for somebody to put together uh, a list of all the risks that have been discussed that we haven't brought up, but professionals have discussed, people that we have hired to look into this, that you have discussed, that we can be exposed to those risks too and understand them. I think Rich will address a lot, you know, Rich is going to address the financial an questions and answers at, at the Finance Committee and then bring it back to a Committee of the Whole, correct? Correct. Another Committee of the Whole, and we can address those exact risks that you're talking about. Um, a week from now, we'll go through the actual financial things with Rich of, of what it would lay out. There's risk of doing this. Uh, I don't think I don't think it's a casual risk. Like or we're not looking at it casually. We are spending a few million dollars here, um, but there's a risk to not do it too. And I think we've got to look at the amount of money we spent already on South Pier and what we're going to have to pay. And so I think we've got to ask all those questions of, if we do nothing, what is that going to cost us? If we wait and, and, and piecemeal it together over the next few years, what would that look like? And I think you've got to have all that information and compare all those projects to make a, a good decision. I think we need to do that in the next couple of weeks. And I understand all that, and I agree with you. I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to have benefits and risk weigh them together. Let's take a look at it. I mean, if we're able to put all the benefits together in a list, we should be able to put all the risks together on the list. That can be done for finance committee. That can be done for the next committee as a whole. Then we're looking at it. I mean, these are risks that our professional people, our employees have talked about that perhaps we haven't touched on that I think we should be privy to and that we should get due consideration. I perhaps agree. more than casual. And w yes, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do, do that, I'm sure. Any other thing else, Alderman Perez? Alderman Moody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question I think the gentleman from Great Lakes will have to answer. On our page 52 in our uh, draft, uh, paragraph 23 about local residents being able to use the water park, it says the agreement shall contain a provision permitting the residents of the city of Sheboygan and their guests and the guests of all other hotels, motels, bed and breakfast located in the city of Sheboygan to have the right to use the water park for a fee. Um, now, is that going to be, I assume, during off-peak times? And as the resort gets more popular, would the local residents eventually be squeezed out of that ability? I'm going to have time to answer that. Yeah, our, our best guess at this time, you know, based on our programming and our past experiences, has been that um, we believe that the park will have some additional capacity even on full house nights when all the rooms are rented. Time, time of course, will actually prove that out. Um, and then as far as a use rate, we would just do whatever is customary and reasonable. Um, it's, it's, it's in our best interest to allow as many people into the park as we can as long as it is safe um, for all the patrons. I don't know if that answers your question. So that would be just residents of the city and their guests and people staying at local other motels and bed and breakfasts, Correct. but not someone who lives in Sheboygan Falls or Plymouth who wants to drive in. Is that what you're well, saying? My, my understanding, and perhaps the attorneys can correct me on interpretation, my understanding is that we, we are agreeing that it is, it is a requirement of Great Lakes to provide access to those people, okay. but it does not legally preclude us from letting people from other communities in. 
Okay. Thank you. Sure, Steve. Yeah. Any other questions, Alderman Moody? No, that's fine. Okay, we got two more Aldermen, then we'll open up to the floor in the back. Everybody's been pretty patient back there. I appreciate that. Uh, Alderman Ports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, three questions left. Uh, first of all, a uh, statement on the, the risk. The real risk is that you build it and nobody comes. You know, we're going to. Uh, Really rely on them to market it, the Chamber of Commerce to market it. Um, it's a pretty exciting project. People should at least come in the beginning. Maybe they won't come a second time. That that's a separate issue. But uh, I think Sheboygan is a nice place. I think people want to come here, and and so hopefully I'm right in the way way I think. Uh, uh, as I said, I have three questions left. Uh, the first one is on page 29. Uh, paragraph H. I, this one I just didn't understand why it was there. It talks about uh, honor before 30 days prior to clo resort closing the resort LLC shall have entered into a guaranteed maximum price construction contractor with the general contractor and it goes on and on. Uh, is this an out for them? We, we, we signed this contract and then they get their final cost and instead of 68 million is 88 million and they just walk away? Or what, what is the purpose of this provision? I, I, I just didn't understand it. I think the, I think the, reason, or the reason that provision is in there is to make sure it's exactly what you're saying. It's to make sure that the projections as to what the costs of the project are going to be um, are accurate in terms of what it's really going to cost to build the project. And um, although um, every effort is being made to to accurately project the costs until the construction contract is entered into, you won't know for sure whether those projections are actually right on the money. And so we want to make sure before we close and commit to um, putting the city's money into the transaction that all of the costs are accounted for and that we know what the total cost of the project is going to be, actual cost of the project, or at least, you know, to the you know, best that, we can I, know that. I guess I, I have a question here. What about costs over overruns? I, I, I just I didn't think quite any, understand the purpose of this. You, know, you, you, um, you say, okay, this is our max, guarantee maximum price, sixty-eight million, and by the time we're done building, and it's seventy-six million. Um, is there? It's my understanding that if it costs seventy-six million, that's their problem. It's not the city's. But I guess I want to be clear on that. That's right. Any cost overruns, um, Great Lakes has agreed that they will pay for any cost overruns. But I think we thought that it would be prudent for us to know, at least at the start of the project, that the numbers were all um, within the range that we thought they were going to come in at. We didn't want to find out that, in fact, the estimates were 25 percent off or something, and we'd start off, you know, needing having cost overruns, so to speak, before we even put the first shovel into the ground. So I think at the starting point, we wanted to have the costs um, as firm as we could have them, realizing that there may be cost overruns and that, in fact, that Great Lakes has agreed that they will pay those cost overruns. Okay. Then, um, uh, uh, all of the reports, before you go on with your next question, uh, you know, general concept here is sign the development agreement, that doesn't necessarily mean the project is going to happen. There's a lot of contingencies in here that both sides have to uh, satisfy before it's go, it's go ahead time. Uh, one of them is if they find that their costs are, you know, way out of sight, that they didn't project, they can walk away. Uh, similarly, there's a lot of things where we can walk away if, if uh, the numbers don't work out, if, uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we're not satisfied with the plans. There's all sorts of outs prior to actually closing the deal that that uh, you know uh, that are common in all redevelopment projects is uh, you know you're you're constantly getting more information as you go along at, at some point you say yes it's a go or no it's not but that that could still happen you know it, it's still possible based on if one of these contingencies isn't met and the other side isn't willing to waive them. Uh, the concept is that either party can walk away at that point, and uh, it's 
it's been a great exercise and uh, you've you spent your dollars uh, hoping it would work out, but uh, it, it doesn't. You know that's just one of the realities of this. But it's hoped that once all those contingencies are satisfied or waived, that then you've got to go with the project. Okay. Well, then, well essentially, then uh, they're prepared to uh, spend with our money and their money 68 million on the project. If it comes in at 76, they can say we don't want to do it, or we want four million more from the city, or we're walking away. So uh, that's uh, basically what I'm understanding what you're saying. Okay. Um, on page 51, paragraph 21, uh, cost savings, cost overruns. There it talks about cost overruns. We don't uh, have to chip in on that. But it talks about cost savings, 50% for the, which is to be shared with the city, 50%, and the uh, resort LLC, 50%. This is the only reference in the document I saw about cost savings. And I wonder, you know, they're projecting 68 million, end up building it for 64, there's four million of savings. How does the city get their two million? Theoretically, um, as the money is dispersed, if in fact um, the estimate is 68 million and it comes in at 64 million, there will be um, two million of the city's money that will never have gone out the door, theoretically, because the loans will not be fully dispersed because all of the money won't have been needed for the, for the, to take care of the cost savings. Okay, now it's been a while since I read that. But that's, I mean, you know, that, that's how it would, I hope, would work. It's been a while since I read that, that provision. Um, if they weren't going to build the condominiums right away, or they, they couldn't get the financing for the condominiums, and I'm going by memory now, uh, they were going to get uh, the 11.4, whatever it is, and a million was going to go in a reserve fund, and they get the 10.4 right up front. Uh, so there isn't two million that's not going to be held back. Uh, also, and again, I'm going by memory, I thought. If the bank threw in the 12, 12 million, we would throw in our full 11 million. So um, I could be wrong because it's been a, a well over a week since I read this document. But I don't see where that's built in, into it that it, it's, it's, this 2 million is going to be held back to the final cost. I, 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 I like this paragraph 21 that we're going to have the fit share in 50 percent of the savings, but I couldn't figure out in the document how that was going to happen. And while it, your, your answer seems reasonable, I don't remember the document reading that way. It, it doesn't, because it's how it would work, um, I think, as a practical matter. The general contractor would just not submit a, let's say it came in with your, using your example, we had $4 million that was mm -hmm. not needed to be spent. The general contractor just wouldn't submit a bill for that last four million, and so the money would never go out the door. It's not a it's not an escrow that would be held back. Um, for example, the same as the other one you referred to for the condominiums. Well, in construction contracts, generally there's a ten percent holdback on bills. Is right, that, that would be paid. In? That would be paid. Yeah, I'm just talking. I think we're just talking about cost savings. If the project costs less than everybody thought it was going to cost. Now, realistically, that never happens. But I, I guess. <laughs> 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 I, I just just want to know how the city was going to get their 50 percent right. because I, I couldn't see it in the document. And then uh, the last uh, question uh, on page 56, paragraph 40. Uh, says the city wants the condominium closing to occur simultaneously with the simultaneously with the resort closing, but the developer has informed the city that it does not yet have a firm commitment for our financing for the condominium condominium project. Has this changed, or is that still an issue? I mean, they're talking they they want the condominium sold in the first year. Do you now have the financing for the condominium project? I think I think very shortly we'll have a term sheet from. Uh, Probably an M and I bank, which says based on a pre-sale ratio of 50%, if you if you build 16 units, you get eight of them pre-committed 
we give you the funding for 16. I think we'll have a term sheet to that effect within the next several weeks, and it, it, it won't be hard to accomplish. I don't, I don't see that as problematic. Okay, so uh, given your prior statement, it doesn't look like there's going to be a huge delay in building these condos. I, we really don't think so. Okay, thank you. I said only one more. Alderman Vanderwilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, this was touched on, but I just want to clarify. If something goes horribly wrong, it's unexpected costs. Let's say you come to us, you're saying, Tom says we need $4.2 million. That'll be determined at the time where that'll come from? Or do we have an idea who that will, who will pay that money of unexpected costs? I think it's going to be dependent upon where that unexpected cost comes from. If it's an unexpected cost on an overrun in their building, I know where it's going to come from then. Well, you're talking about we have an overall project, uh, a project cost in excess of what we anticipate, say $4 million, too much. The, um, Great Lakes has agreed that any cost overruns will be paid by Great Lakes. And typically how that would work is that um, during the course of the project, both the city and the uh, construction lender will be watching the costs and making sure that um, there is enough money to complete the project. And if all of a sudden more is needed than the balance of the two loans, the principal balance of the two loans, the, the lender would typically look at Great Lakes and say, you've got to give us you know, the, the amount of the cost overruns before we disperse any more of our loan funds. That's typically how it would work. And that would happen as construction goes. With each draw request, typically, the lender and the city will look at that and make sure that what's been paid for um, up to the point in time of the draw request has been paid for, that the work's been done, and that there's enough money still sort of in the pot to complete the project and all the work that needs to be done after that draw request. That's your question. Thank you. A very quick one from Eberg. Uh, question relating to the uh, increased capacity of the convention center. Uh, we increased the capacity, bumbled up by 40%. What does that do for our parking situation? Given you've got one person, one car that typically comes to conventions, and I see the director is smiling. <laughs> It's, a, it's an issue that still needs to be addressed, and it will be addressed during the planning process through the, the precise implementation plan, and Great Lakes still has to go through that process. They've, I think uh, on Wednesday night, the zoning will be complete if passed by the Common Council, and then the next step is this precise implementation plan, which addresses the parking issues. Uh, we haven't discussed that. <coughs> one other quick question. Uh, you said one. It relates to the uh, $250,000 price tag on the condo unit. I think probably for people who hear that locally, that seems to be somewhat of a sticker shock. If you could the develop, give us an idea of who might typically be investing in that, because I think we're talking about a different kind of investor that's a passive investor that's looking to uh, basically buy something over time. And I guess. What cohort do you see out there that would be would find a project like this attractive and some potential advantages to someone to invest in a project like this? Oh, almost all of the buyers will probably come from Chicago, Milwaukee, maybe some from Fox River Valley. Uh, that's where they all come. That's where they come from in the Dells. That's where they come from in Door County. And to have a, you know a lakefront setting for somebody who's coming from you know, Lake Forest, Illinois, at this type of price tag is, relatively speaking, a great value. So, but just, as you say, it, it, it's a different uh, a buyer profile. Okay, I'm going to leave that back mic on. Um, let's open up questions to the, uh, to the group in the back. You've listened patiently. If you'd come to the mic and, and give us your name and address, just for the record. Uh, James Boren, uh, 1526 Knollcrest Drive in Sheboygan. 
I need a little bit of a clarification on a question that Alderman Schultz asked. Uh, from listening from before, I understand that the convention center and restaurant are going to be about 30 some thousand square feet of the development. And my concern is with the uh, problems that we possibly are facing with the city with the uh, shared revenue next year and the year after, I think it's very important that we get as much property taxes or fees out of this development, including the convention center and restaurant. Now, <clears throat> uh, Alderman Schultz, or uh, uh, city attorney, uh, mentioned that there's a possibility that there will be, we will be getting some property taxes out of the convention center, but is that in the agreement? And my idea would be that you should have something definite in the agreement that you're at least going to cover the fire protection, the police protection, and the snow removal, <clears throat> whether that conference center makes any money or not. On my commercial property over on Michigan Avenue, I get a property tax bill every year, the 20th of December, whether I make any money or not. Uh, I think Marie Ellis has addressed that, that the tax revenues are going to be based on, you know, this income producing property and typically income producing properties, the, uh, the taxes, property taxes are going to be based on the income approach in the, uh, as the, as opposed to a market approach or cost approach, except uh, in the early years when the cost approach should be used because there's no income yet. But, uh, uh, the income from to the resort operator uh, derived from the convention center and the restaurant will be factored into the value of the property, which will get factored into the property tax value. I still think the city should have a protection to at least cover city services that are being provided down there in light of the possible shared revenue loss. And I think that could you have a right to negotiate that with any developer that comes into Sheboygan for payments in lieu of taxes. And I think that should be in the agreement to protect. And that also protects the other businesses that are already down there. You've got a lot of restaurants and bars down there that own property that are paying property tax every year. And if this convention center and restaurant are not paying property taxes that, or even fees for city services, you put them at a competitive disadvantage. Well, the developer is required to make reimbursement payments based on the schedule, whether there's property taxes there or not. Uh, if, if there aren't property taxes there uh, to cover those, that's the developer's cost. They've got to make those payments, uh, whether there's any room taxes or, or property taxes generated. So we will be getting revenue from, uh, from the developer irrespective. Now, if the thing goes dark and uh, shuts down and the developer is gone, we've got the guaranteed amounts, but and other than that, uh, we got hopefully a bank that will get some other developer in there. But, uh, you know, we, we will be getting payments to cover our debt, uh, whether or not the property taxes are there or the room taxes are there or not under that uh, guaranteed reimbursement amount. Well, it's my understanding that the developer will lease that to a third party to run the restaurant and the convention center. Is that right? right. Well, somebody should be at least responsible for the city services that are being provided down there. That's my thought. And I think that should be in the agreement, and I think it should be in writing that at least at a minimum you're going to get that, whether that convention center or restaurant makes any money or not, because it's, it's over 30,000 square feet of that, of that development. That's the only problem I have with, that's the only question I had. Otherwise, I think the people that have worked on this have done an excellent job, but I think we have to uh, protect ourselves to at least get minimum fees for city services. Thank you. Thank you. Is it related to this yeah. last question, quickly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just gonna have, we got, the convention center is owned by the city. We don't get any taxes on the Armory now either. Okay. It's a city-owned building. Uh, the taxes that we end up deriving from the convention centers even being there is when we have conventions, we sell, sell rooms. We get the room tax on the room. It also increases the overall 
profit of the hotel, which if it's valued on the income approach, increases the property taxes that way. Uh, but the convention center is a city-owned property. I, he did allude to one thing, though, that I had a question about, which I pretty much knew I knew the answer is, we're building a convention center, and they get it rent-free. It's something we get 30 days use. We we're also now including the restaurant in there, and it's my assumption that they're running out the restaurant and they're getting all the rent from the restaurant instead of the city getting any rent from the restaurant, and maybe that would address part of his concerns if instead of them getting all the rent or, you know, that the city got part of that rent. But um, isn't when they bring in income, that's when she gets to tax it? Well, that's part of it, but I mean, uh, the the because if they don't rent it out, they probably aren't paying a lot no, of income. No, no problem with the convention center not being on the tax rolls, you know. But we do have a restaurant there that really could be part of the hotel instead of the convention center, and then be on the tax rolls versus being part of the convention center and not being on the tax rolls. Okay. All right. Uh, again, in the back. Welcome back to the chambers, and give us your name and address. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I am Richard W. Susha, 15 North Point Drive in Sheboygan, and a former city employee. <laughs> well, here I am tonight in, in the flesh and not in a newspaper and, and not in a letter to the editor. And first to comment, I think it's interesting to note that while the local development group and friends of Sheboygan are aggressively pushing this project. Never once do they talk about the $11 million police project. I think the construction of both of those at this time are fiscally irresponsible. Now to the South Pier project. It's a risk, as everybody acknowledges. Therefore, I think we have to really leverage more private money to city money. I have reviewed this lengthy document and apparently now it's outdated already and I find safeguards in it on both sides but there are still some questions <clears throat> and I guess I won't get some of these answered tonight and I won't be asking specifically for some of these questions to be answered. But I would like to see a dollar total for all the public works improvements. Exhibit E in my f agreement was blank. I have no idea what those dollars are if we're talking 2 million, 5 million, 10 million. Does it include, and they're showing it, the, the bridge from the, the river walk to the new development? Does it include that? Does it include costs for? The roundabout change, I don't know, and maybe the aldermen know, but I don't see it in my Exhibit E at all. And why should the developer's reserve fund partly be funded by the room tax revenues? That was answered. I don't agree, but that was answered. And what I'd like to know is what the occupancy rate that they're using for projecting these revenues the new chart that came up tonight, I see the guaranteed room tax went up from a million one to about a million nine. Eight hundred thousand dollar increase from a week or two ago, and I have no idea where that uh, figure is coming from. And I don't understand why the condo owners can't have occupancy for more than 60 days a year. Now that's not the same agreement that Ostoff has, and this sounds more like a timeshare arrangement than it does uh, a, where you can live down there 10, 12 months a year if you so see fit. Now in there it says, that the city, if they want to build the amusement park, which I assume is the water park, uh, if they want to do it before three years, uh, that's at the city's cost. I guess I would like that to be clarified. And if the interest rate 
that we are going to go out and borrow is about hopefully three, four, five percent. Guessing now, I don't know what the rates would be. They're good, but assume a four percent. And I read where our total indebtedness is going to go from about forty-five million to sixty-eight million dollars with these two projects. That's a huge jump, uh, at least as reported in the uh, Sheboygan Press. And now we propose to lend the developer $11, $12 million at a 0% interest rate. That to me is a real sticking point. We are not a lending institution, and a bank wouldn't consider that arrangement, and neither should the city. And besides, you are using property tax revenues plus the roof taxes, according to the last sheet, to guarantee the revenues. That's still 0%. That's still 0%. This is a risky project, a good project, but risky. And I'm not against it. But can we afford it? The TIF 6 will still be short $20 million if all this happens. $20 million we will still be short in valuation. And I remind you that this marina was built uh, using a marina development agreement, projections of a million dollars coming in from the marina operator. We've never realized that million dollars, and now we are putting this new project in with the marina project, and hopefully we can help bail out the marina project down the way. That's why this South Pier development project must be factual, not just projections. And I say we cannot rely on the words, trust us. And I commend the SDC for gathering $2 million for that marina project and for stepping forward on this project. But there are too many unanswered questions for us to be jumping into this in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Okay, anybody else from the gallery? Going, 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 gone. <laughs> I'm Gary Dolmas, 1901 South A Street in Sheboygan. I'm here representing the SDC and the Friends of Sheboygan. I've spoken to you people before. Is, first of all, an answer to Alderman Schultz's question, which you asked of your council. Is this a good project? Is there a risk? Are you behind it? I will tell you right now that yes, the Sheboygan Development Corporation and the Friends of Sheboygan are behind it. I appreciate what Mr. Susha said. We have looked at this, we've talked with Great Lakes for well over a year. You've had Rich Gephardt, your finance director. You've had Steve McLean, your city attorney. You've had Tom Holton, Paulette Enders. You've had your mayor. You've had Ann from Coils and Brady. You've had bond council sit down with Great Lakes and negotiate a deal. You had some of the finest minds working on this project. It was not taken lightly. Yes, there is some risk. I don't know of anything in the business world where there is no risk. I would like to open my doors tomorrow morning and say there is no risk. But I also know if I'm going to stay in business, I'm going to have to take some risk. We talked about to look at the overall project. We can't forget that. I think we do have to look at the overall benefits of the project. Yes, you have to consider the risk, but you have to consider the overall benefits of the project. You have 300 plus jobs. Boy, I think when Kohler Company lays off 175 people to say we could have 300 new jobs is phenomenal. I think that if we can have construction work go on in this city when we got general contractors and we got carpenters and we have people that aren't working is phenomenal. 
I don't know how we'd ever get a convention center. I can tell you that the Friends of Sheboygan and the STC would love to see a convention center. If we can get a convention center, and it's paid for by room tax dollars, which falls in the legal statutes, why wouldn't we get a convention center? Retail spinoff, it's tremendous. It's tremendous what kind of retail spinoff we can get off of a project like this. Other hotel usage, they should be elated. Great Lakes has got, what, 183 rooms, 64 condos, so what is that, 200 and some odd rooms. Not everybody's gonna stay there. The other hotels are gonna benefit from this also. The other thing, we got a $52 million tax base. We got a room tax that's gonna pay for these things. Also, I'd ask you and I'd encourage you to look at the document when you get the revised document. There's guarantees in there. When we looked at the document, when the city looked at the document, your negotiating team, they made Great Lakes come to the table, not once, not twice, not three times. They just kept bringing them back. Anne's one tough negotiator. Okay, she brought on another million dollars just recently on the table as far as guarantees. If we were to go back one year ago and look at the rice coal property, you had a bunch of oil tanks on it, okay, you had a bunch of storage tanks, you had some dumpy buildings, a bunch of empty beer bottles. If you turn around and look at those pictures, that's what it could be. It could be a world-class facility. We've looked at this real close. We've asked our financial people from the SDC, from the Friends of Sheboygan, to look at it from a business standpoint. It's not our decision. We're not making this decision. You guys and you ladies are making this decision. We believe it's a good decision for the Common Council and for the City of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County. We talk about a timeline because there's been a lot of communication about such a fast timeline. Mark Vaccaro, the, uh, one of the, the partners and owners of, the, of, of Great Lakes said, and I will repeat it, you got a PGA that is gonna open up or have, uh, have a project in August of 2004. That comes once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime. And yeah, we'd love to see the helicopters flying over and showing that peninsula and promoting Sheboygan. That's an opportunity we can't miss. We're not gonna get another one. Okay, if we are, we might get another one, but not right away. Okay, we don't get them that quick. We talk about if this project fails. There's been a lot of comments. If this project fails, it's because not enough people were involved. I can share something, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school here. When you have to negotiate a $52 million deal, and you got 18 people in the room, which there were at times, that was tough enough. You had another 16 to negotiate it. I think that's what we rely on our professional people, and that's how I started this thing off. You had some great people doing negotiations, and as Alderman Schultz said, yes, we may need to rely on them, and take their advice. It's a very difficult document to understand. I can't understand it. Okay, and I, I, I'm not saying that because it's we're stupid. It's just very difficult to understand. And if it's up to 80 pages now, it just became another 16 or 18 pages more to understand. As I said a week or two ago, our SDC people would be more than happy to answer any questions about the financial parts of it. But we, we don't really have to. You got Rich Gephardt, which is one great finance director. He watches your money very closely. You got a city attorney that dots every I and every T and then goes back and checks it. And then you hired Ann, who went back and checked all his I's and all his T's. And you got Paulette, and you got Tom Holton. You had good people look at this. I think this is a time where we need to put some faith in, and I, I guess I don't say just trust me because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we rely on experts. And when I need to have business decisions, I need to go to the experts. You got the experts. In the next week or so, or next week, whatever it's gonna be, you're gonna have all the numbers. We're gonna ask you to take a real close look at it. We believe that when you sit down with these people, they're gonna tell you you got a good deal. I'd hate to see this not happen. Not only because, yes, we've put personal monies up, and we did put personal monies up. The land was bought with money from the, from the Friends of Sheboygan. 
That's how we got the land. Some are grants, some are loans. Okay, but that's how we got the land. Do we have a vested interest in it? Not as individuals, but as people that have our companies in this city and people that have employees that work in this city and live in this city. Yes, we believe it's a good investment and it's going to raise our, it's going to keep our taxes down. We're going to have something on the South Pier that is second to none. And I think this council can be proud to say that they passed that. We put our foot forward. We're standing behind it. We're asking the city to do the same thing. Mr. Susha referenced being short $20 million on TIF 6. If you look at that, that accounts for, I believe it's 17 acres. 17 acres out of 41 or 42. Can you put another $20 million on that? TIF 6 doesn't just sit in that peninsula, just so everybody's aware of that. It goes across the river, reference to the armory, to the Green Warehouse site. TIF 6 is not a peninsula. It's all part of that marina. Do we think you can put out another $20 million? Yeah, I think so. If you got something classy enough to start off with, but if we're gonna put a bunch of condos down there, or some single family housing, or a bunch of fish shanties, now nah, I don't think you're gonna get another $20 million. Because I don't think we can get $52 million out of fish shanties and condominiums. Will we step forward as the SDC and the Friends to help find another $20 million for the development down there? You darn right. You darn right. We've stepped forward this far, we're not gonna walk away and say, Bye boys, bye girls. That's a commitment you have from the SDC. We'll keep rolling. We'll keep trying to help and work with the city. We're not trying to strong arm anybody. We're just trying to see a good project for Sheboygan, and we think it's a great project. And I ask you, when you look at this, look at the risk, but also look at the benefits. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have anything in our back pocket if this does not go through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alderman Warner. Hang on. I've been looking at this document as long as I could, just like the rest of you have. And we've received a lot of information this evening. We've also had two weeks to review the basic document. It's now up to us individually review the facts and come to a conclusion. This council. Over the past year, many people have worked very hard to get to this point. Mayor Schramm, Rich, our finance director, Steve, our city attorney, Tom, our director of public works, Paulette, our director of planning and development, and others have spent countless hours, both in Sheboygan and away, working on this agreement. Many times, these people, the mayor included, put in 12 to 14 hour days, not getting home until 11 o'clock p.m. at night or later. After their exhaustive efforts, and those of the Sheboygan Development Corporation and the Friends of Sheboygan, the baton has been passed to us. It is time for this council to prepare for the future of Sheboygan. Time for this council to do its part and its duty. Over the next couple of weeks, make sure to take notes of any questions you have. Call the mayor. Call the staff, email your questions in. You can and should get the answers you need to make an informed decision. But it is your responsibility to seek those answers. I urge you to do this on a continual basis, not only with this issue, but with all issues. The appropriate city officials have done their job. The mayor and staff have brought this to the Common Council for our review. The staff is here to provide the council guidance and expert advice. Use this resource, ask your questions, and you'll get answers. You do not have to wait until the last minute to get the answers you need. This city is not static, it is not standing still, and neither is the world around us. Sometimes things do move, move faster than we like, but that is part of the world we live in today. Competent and reliable people have worked very hard on this, and we owe them the respect to do our part in the same way. Lastly, I think we all realize the importance of this project to the future of the city of Sheboygan. The added tax base, the additional jobs, the business activity it will produce, the diversification of our economy, our local economy, 
All of those are benefits we as a city will reap, and it will ripple across the entire county <coughs> and beyond. I wish to thank Mayor Schramm, the staff, the STC, the Friends of Sheboygan for their perseverance, many times in the face of undue criticism, for in bringing this project forward. It takes courage and vision to lead, but it also takes a lot of hard work, and I think that hard work is evident tonight. I think it truly is time for sunrise on the Sea Rise Coal Yard and its transformation into the South Pier District and ultimately the Blue Harbor Resort and Conference Center. Let's do our job and let's move forward. Thank you, Alderman Warner. Alderman Manny. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question about our debt structure. I understand, and please define this for me. Um, it sounds somewhat unbelievable, but I, perhaps it's true. That we can maintain our 3% debt structure and not transcend that, and still do the police station and the South Pier project. A quick outline of that structure I would appreciate. I believe what you said is true, but I don't have those numbers right in front of me. Mm -hmm. But I, in discussing with uh, the mayor and Rich before Rich left town, and he apologized for not being here. This what he needed to do today was set a long time ago. Um, but in some discussions, the debt structure would be set up because we have a self-imposed three percent limit, and that we would still try to maintain under that. The state imposes, I believe, it's a six percent limit, but the. Huh? Five, five or six percent, five percent limit, and the council has decided to stay under six percent, uh, three percent. I'm sorry, um, and it's my understanding that we would still maintain that. That's one of the things we'll be discussing with Rich in how we would do that and, and the dollars that would be needed to do that in the, in the structure and future borrowings for things like Mr. Shusha and you have just brought up. How would that reflect in future borrowings? and affect our debt service in the, in the future for other projects. That's something we're going to be discussing, and we will bring that back to you. Anything else? Alderman Wangaman. Thank you. A lot of questions have been asked tonight. We've been given a lot of facts. We've seen a whole bunch of beautiful drawings. We've got experts aplenty. But one question hasn't been asked is what do the taxpayers of Sheboygan want? This is a representative body. Have we forgotten the people who sent us here? I hope not, because after all is said and done, the bottom line is what do the people who pay the bills want? What do the taxpayers want? This document keeps getting thicker and thicker. We get all kinds of presentations, but again, the bottom line is what do the taxpayers want? I challenge every alderman in this distinguished body to find out what the people in their districts want and to represent that desire because that's why we're supposed to be here. This is a representative body. I really do hope when all is said and done, we actually do represent the people who uh, put us in these seats. Thank you. If not, you'll hear from them next April. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman, uh, Alderman, Alderman Shram, uh, Mayor Shram. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Alderman Manny, if you'd like to stop up tomorrow, I will show you those figures. Correct. We can do both projects and we can stay under a 3% cap. Uh, correction for our past Mayor Shusha, we are not borrowing $11.2 million for the police facility. And my statement to the council was we're borrowing 6.5 or 6.7 million. And doing that, we can do both projects. We can do the South Pier, district, and we can also do the police station and stand near a 3% cap. But I do have those figures in my office. If you'd like to see them, I will give them to you tomorrow. Chief? Chief, you sat quiet all day long. I thought you'd get through one meeting without... I'd just like to say one thing. It's a sense of seriousness in this meeting tonight, the concern, and that's good. But I want to remember one thing, why it's good that we have a decision to make. We have a decision to make because of our country. And I think we should remember that there's people, men and women in this world, from our United States, that are protecting our country. 
For the right that they have, the decisions that we're making tonight for the future of Sheboygan, I want to say that I've stayed in a facility in Wisconsin Dells many times. I stayed in facilities in, in Michigan. I think we should be glad that a company of this sort has come forth to the city of Sheboygan to do this. I can tell you, I can speak on behalf of many people in labor. I came from ba labor background that they're excited about this. I think they're hoping you dot the I's, cross the T's, and make it right for Sheboygan. And again, let's remember the troops across seas who are protecting the right that you 16 aldermen have to make a great decision like you have tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Okay, as it was said, I think all the know. Okay, Denny Moyer. I thought we had her. <laughs> take Hang one. on. Let me oh, think. Okay. I just would like to take one minute here. Uh, uh, basically to, to thank the mayor and to thank uh, the staff and to thank the SDC and, and the Friends of Sheboygan and the development uh, 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 redevelopment group uh, for, for getting it this far. This is unbelievable. And I would like to share with you just you're looking at numbers and you're looking at pros and cons and you should. That's what you're here for. But I'd like to share with you a couple of things that you may not have, have thought about. Um, Tourism. Tourism, by its nature, is an investment. It's a, just a simple investment. If you have any idea how much money the Convention and Visitors Bureau of Minneapolis invested with the NCAA to get that tournament this last week, it would boggle your mind. If you had any idea how much money the fans spent in Minneapolis last week, it too would boggle your mind. Great Lakes people are talking, they're going to hire 300 people. There's going to be so much more than 300 more people working. Because in the wintertime, we can do things now. We rank ninth in the, in, the, in the state in tourism, and essentially we're only working five months a year. If we have a water park, if we have an ability to bring in conventions, we can have people here in the winter. And then Briscoe County and Dockside don't have to worry about just having people on weekends in the summer. They're going to have to hire people all year long. Everybody moves up. And we don't need any more people in the summer, right? Hotels are full. You know what we can do here in the summer if, if I had more room to promote things with that lake? Sailing is a big sport. We can't bring in an NCAA. We don't have a, I'm not asking you to build me a coliseum here. We got Lake Michigan. Sailing regattas we can bring in. We can bring in huge fishing tournaments. We can't do it now because there's, it's pointless because there's no place to put anybody. Another 180 rooms will just will get us over the top. We've gone so far, and, and, uh, and that's essentially all I've got to say, but the dreams and, and the things that we can do in this community with a little vision, a little courage, uh, and a little support for our leaders is, uh, is something that will, will just put us on the map, and, and our kids for years to come will, uh, will really thank us for it. Thank you. Thanks, Denny. Now I shut off that mic. <clears throat> um, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. It's been a long night. There was a lot of questions answered, but I think we also asked as many questions to still need answers to as we do um, to still work on. Uh, the next process on this whole thing will be the Finance Committee will be meeting next week, Monday. Um, and then the, we will have another Committee of the Whole in which we can go over more specific dollars and comparisons that we've been asked for. Again, please, if you have any questions, contact the staff. They're all here. Contact the SDC. Contact the city staff, the mayor's office. You know, I don't think there's been a day that gone by that I've talked to Mayor Schramm, and one of the last words out of my mouth would be, how's the Great Lakes thing going? All you got to do is ask, and you'll get an update from them of, of what's happening. So we're all in the building. Talk to him, talk to him, talk to them. Ask the questions. If you don't get them, we need to get all the questions answered before we move on. If it takes another meeting, if it takes two more meetings, we've got to do that. I think it, everybody deserves the right to have all the information before we make this decision. It's been moved in. Seconded to adjourn. And thank you very much.